weapons for prisoners. No. He then politely frog marched the manager. To Why the freezer, buddy? I would never ever tr tr tromp a bunch of fucking humans into a freezer. What are you, goddamn Hitler? Like, what? Like, do not march humans into a freezer. What if the cops never get the call, or they forget, or the, or the police station catches on fire like it always does, and the guy goes running home, being like, my cat's on fire, my cat's on fire, instead of paying attention to the phone call that they just got? What if you just shove all those humans in there, and they stay in there for 18 hours and freeze solid and you kill seven people the freezer never should have been part of your goddamn plan it makes it makes it makes you bad that is what made you bad in my opinion the minute that you start playing with people's lives you don't need to do that you could easily just be like all right i have the money i'm going to leave now goodbye and just like be like all right you're tied up stay here for an hour and then free yourselves i don't want to put you in the freezer you'll freeze to death they're, they're like i don't know man like the, the the sheer disregard for what could happen is so reckless endangerment that it, that it makes me sick like what if nobody ever comes you know people never come sometimes we know that the police just never show sometimes we know that they don't it happens so what if that happens that time do those people just freeze solid in that freezer you were playing games with people that you shouldn't have been like a reckless criminal they, they want to pay respect to you because you stumped the cops for so long and you're like autistic and dedicated but honestly a good autistic dedicated person never would have put those people at risk by putting them in the freezer or pointing a gun at them or doing anything like that Safe and you're still a piece of shit worthless criminal that does deserve like 40 years in jail you, there's nothing they could say that'll ever change my opinion of that the minute that you leveled a gun at, at a fellow American's face I believe you of the same sort of tr traitor ilk as, as Trump Trump, you know, stand back, stand by, you know, full blown traitor. Asked him to open it up, and you aim it. You you aim a gun at another American, and you're not a cop. You're a fucking traitor, in my opinion. Why are you aiming a gun at another American? That's fucked up. Like I guess in defense it's okay, but but as as a robber, I don't ever want you aiming guns at another American. You know, it's funny. I don't care if you rob other countries at all, and, 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 it's, and it's sort of weird. I actually really don't care if you go rob a bunch of other countries. I don't. But I don't want you like saying that we're there to save them, like Afghanistan or anything like that. I, I would just prefer that you were just honest about it. And the minute that you're pointing a gun at somebody to get something out of them, you are no longer an American. If it's an American that you're robbing, you're a traitor. You you pointed a gun at another American and try to fleece another American out of American goods. You're a fucking traitor if you're pointing a gun at another American. I really feel this way too. I know it sounds like crazy leftist stuff, but honestly, if you're pointing, a, if, unless you're defending yourself, if you if you are pointing a gun at another American, you're not a cop. To me, you're a traitor. That that is that's a misuse of the firearm. It's a misuse of your governmental rights. It's a misuse of your weapons rights. It's a misuse of your fucking judgment and your logic. It's it's like why would you ever be pointing a, a gun at another American? Unless that American is trying to rob you or kill you or rape you, rape you or steal from you or something like that, which could be the case, and we do have that, and it does happen. But honestly, I think we're far too willing to point guns at other Americans right now. Way too willing. For an unconfirmed amount of money, some reports estimate that it was in the region of fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, I'm sure. After leaving everyone on the floor, he then nipped around the fire exit at the back of the store and triggered the alarm. By the time the police arrived on the scene, naturally everyone assumed that the robber had made a swift exit from the building and was now miles away. Yep, yeah, this, this is tricks that I use all the time. I won't even leave the scene sometimes. I'll just be like, well, the one thing that they expect is, is, is running, so that's the one thing I'm not going to do, you know? And I'm not going to run or act scared or anything like that. And so, yeah, and, and, and um... <clears throat> I, I can I can even st I can cite an example of when I use this against police live in real time right when I was young we used to go to the DSP which is the Denver skate park and we would go there after 1 a.m from between 1 a.m till 3 30 in the morning something like that we would get the entire skate park to ourselves and you didn't have to compete with anybody else because they didn't want uh, truism tickets or uh, you know uh, curfew tickets or anything like that and so we would come and take the skate park to ourselves, which were, there was only like nine of us or something. So an entire skate park to nine people is insane. It's, it's so fun. It's some of the most fun I've ever had. And it's dark, so you got to be careful because the shadows will mislead you. And if you fall in the bowls, you don't have any light to see. So I got very good at skateboarding very fast because I didn't have any fucking light to see at night when we went to the skate park. But I learned the bowls right quick. I learned how I can still probably run the bowls. I can still probably do it. It's a skill you never really learn. No, sorry, you never really lose. It's like lean downwards in, lean backwards up, lean downwards in, lean backwards up. It's, it's you know. 
And, uh, and, uh, anyways, we would stay at the, at the skate park, but, but this also made us a target to the local pigs quite a lot. They came something like 25 times or something, and we only ever got caught once, right? We got away all the other 24 times. How we did this is, is by the first time we knew, right? The first time they chased us, we knew because, because only one of us got caught, right? Uh, my friend was like, I'm not running. He, they're only going to chase whoever runs. He was drunk and he just stated this. And we were like, wait, maybe he's right. And so none of us ran except for there, there was like seven of us and two of us ran and, and one of them got away because the cop could only, it's only one cop usually. So the cop can only catch one person out of the seven or whatever. So the cop caught somebody that time. It was my friend Christopher. And he, and he got a, he got a, 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 a fucking, uh, you know, a curfew ticket and, and all that. And, and when, when we were like 17 and, and we learned after that one that the cop chases whoever runs, right? So if the lights go flashing, and you're in a and you're in a crowd of people, and it's kind of like being the cockroach with the lights coming on, and you're like, "Oh shit, he's coming! He's coming! He's gonna get one of us!" Right? The people who run are the people that they chase. If you stand there and you hold your hands up, they might come roll you. But because you're there with your hands in the air, and you're like, "I'm sorry, I don't want to be afraid or run from the cops or be do anything unreasonable as an American," you got your hands in the air. They're gonna go chase somebody, right? And we learned early on that yeah they're gonna go chase the person who ran so we started bringing other people to the skate park that we didn't know as well and they would do stuff like run and we liked it when they ran because you know because then once once somebody runs who doesn't know the deal the cop chases that person down the block and catches them right but the rest of us can just calmly walk in different directions and the cops never going to be able to get anybody else. The rest of everybody there can immediately take the time that it takes that cop to catch one person. This is general dynamics. It works this way. It's always worked this way. John Nash won the uh, the, the, uh, the the Nobel Prize for it. Like like the um you know it, 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 like if all of you run at once, he can only catch one person. That's the law. That's the that's the the general dynamics. It's like it's just it's just how it works. He can only catch one, right? Because you can't chase five things at once if you one entity you can only chase one so 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 the first we learned very quickly to tell people to run that we didn't like and they would run and the cop chases that person that you don't like and then you just calmly walk in the opposite direction and i mean calmly walk you don't have to run you don't have to act all furtive or like laugh or, or like pay attention to what's going on with your friend who's getting caught or anything like that you can just calmly walk away from the hunt if you walk in the opposite direction of the hunt and 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 the, and the bank robber knows this so he just hangs around the scene and convinces them that everybody ran and he's one of the people that stayed behind counting up all of his loot oh that's so clever he just sneaked back through the bike thing and is hiding in circle city isn't he what they failed to realize is that the robber had actually just sneaked back onto the main shop floor and disappeared through the magic secret passageway behind them Yep, but you'd have to be a true gremlin, true loser to, to, to ever gravitate towards doing stuff like this. I did it one time, but I would never do it in a professional capacity where somebody else could put you in jail for it. That is taking risks that is entirely unacceptable. The bike racks. For instance, what could happen if they catch you hiding in Toys R Us, right? They could be like, you you are a, an accomplished bank robber with 60 bank robberies. And you have been sneaking around a child's toy store for two years and, and living here and using it as a safe house while you rob other banks and other McDonald's and other fucking toy stores. And you're stealing the toys and giving them to kids and all this, right? And, like, you gotta wonder, like, I don't know, like, wouldn't it be better to just not be that weird? I think it would be better to just not be that weird. To not be living in the, and also and, and where where I was going, I forgot the point that I was going to make was that Toys R Us could potentially, if they catch you in the store and they bust you in the store, they can make an argument that no kid will ever come to that store again and sue you for the kind of crazy damages that the tort lawyers talk about at their cigar bars. They could be like, yeah, this Toys R Us realized that no child will ever cross the threshold ever again after they realized that a bank robber was living in in a fucking toy display there for two years right underneath uh, the staff's nose 
what what will most likely happen is 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 litigation which is that oh the kids don't feel safe at the toys r us anymore that's a terrible breach of trust that cost us billions of dollars of, of re repeat business at this particular toys r us over a 20 year period right and so they step and the the smooth corporate lawyers they don't truck with losing money right and so toys r us literally literally probably stepped in and considered probably killing this guy they probably consider killing him taking an assassination contract out on him because he's a lot of bad PR for Toys R Us. He's really bad. He's a disaster for Toys R Us. No kids will go to Toys R Us that they know that there's some crazy, creepy 60, 60s McDonald's robbed, you know, 80 billion served, 60 McDonald's robbed at gunpoint, right? Creepy bank robbers living in a toy display in the back. No kid's ever going to cross that threshold again. That represents like $100 million worth of loss to the Toys R Us and they will sink you with the lawyers they will bring a lawyer and they will be like your particular stunt cost us a hundred million dollars in repeat business and now the children of, of butte, Mon butte montana will not enter the toys r us or the walmart anymore because they know that there might be some creeper bank robber in there with with semi-automatic weapons who have stuck up 60 mcdonald's and and creep around at night and eat the baby food right and and and, and what i would be really afraid of here and, and what i'm surprised didn't happen was mcdum was both McDonald's and Toys R Us trying to sue him for a hundred million dollars to try to prevent this from ever happening again because the damage that it does to their business is actually incalculable and also like like you can't you can't tell how bad it is for them when this happens and also they might not ever get it back toys r us was dying as it was if you killed their image so bad that they believe that it, that an underbridge troll with an automatic weapon is living in the toy display in the aisle they won't go to toys r us anywhere much less that one that that he was that he was he was sneaking around in and so in the real world it's weird that toys r us didn't sue him for a hundred hundred million dollars and get all that bank money money back ju just on lawyers and stuff right and sue him for a hundred million dollars because that's probably the amount of damage that he did to toys r us's image that's literally probably what they could get from 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 to to, from a from from a from a lawyer you know i really feel that way i feel that feel that toys r us could have sued this particular robber for a hundred million dollars for making toys r us seem like a a fucking a shanty town hideout for for bank robbers you know and like, and, and I'm sure they they wanted his blood. They probably wanted every dollar he had, and they probably did sue. But I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you can successfully win that. But I I hope that they did sue him because the the bid the, the the image and business damage that that he did to them is in is incalculable i remember when when everything went sour for toys r us and i remember them whining about how much money they lost and i remember all of the fucking television coverage they got and how the kids can't buy toys anymore and kb toys like like took over or something like that or whatever it is like uh, uh what is it i uh, uh, can't remember the name of all the companies stendar or something like that I forget all the names of the the fucking the, the toy companies but like uh yeah, like that that is so bad for their image. This idea that a kid could walk in a Toys R Us, a Toys R Us and get stuck up by a machine gun bandit right outside the 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 fucking the toy aisle. That's so bad for 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 for, for Toys R Us's image that I wonder if this criminal literally single-handedly killed Toys R Us because when this story came out, I bet every mother in America probably monitored it and was like I'm not going to Toys R Us ever again. That's what's happening behind the lines that, or you know behind the scenes at Toys R Us. There's there's bank robbers living in their toy displays. And trust me, this was probably so tragic for Toys R Us. I, I, I don't think Toys R Us is around anymore and it might be because of this. It's actually kind of crazy is is toys r us still around no they filed for bankruptcy in 2017 i think this is part of it when people think that a bank robber is sleeping in your fucking toy aisle they won't go to your store i think this was part of it and i'm surprised that toys r us did not try to sue this fucking asshole for everything that he had and everything that he didn't have all that bank robbery money toys r us should have come and take the, and, and taken that for the kids and donated it to a to a to a fucking you know save the kids foundation but no, they, they probably let this guy skate, essentially. He got, he got 45 years. But, I mean, they could have sued him for $100 million, too. They probably should have.
Police were interviewing the traumatized customers and employees. That's what really sinks criminals. When criminals understand that they owe, they owe something like like whatever they were stealing the money for in the first place, right? Like they they have this dream that they're gonna make twenty million dollars or something like that and never have to worry about money ever again. But no, that's often what the fines are if you attempt to do something like this. It's often the fines are like twenty million dollars. Where are you gonna get that as a criminal? They'll put you in pauper's prison. That that's where they don't even make the food very good, you know. Was just if you're in pauper's prison in America, I mean, there's worse places in the world and in history, but I mean, it, not not many. Store watching the whole investigation unfold on his baby eyes. <laughs> Yeah, within the space of just a couple of weeks, Reefman had rather let himself down in more ways than one. That trip to the dentist's was now clearly bothering him because he realized that it yep. It's the only evidence he ever left was, was his teeth. That's enough sometimes. Wasn't a good idea for a local dentist to keep dental records on file. Which so he breaks in, blackmails the secretary, steals the safe, <laughs> scares the shit out of the dentist gets the gets the wrecker from him and then disappears out of the town forever right or some kind of fire maybe maybe he goes the heisenberg route where they they rig up like 15 large you know fucking dump truck batteries to a magnet and they fry all the goddamn laptops in the fucking police evidence room something like that it's going to be something like that he, he this guy's machiavellian I love this series of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, the casual criminalists because I'm a casual criminalist. These guys are professional. I've always been a casual criminal. And I love just, like, kind of, under, like, trying to guess what the actual ramifications were. You could then link John's on to his two ideas. Yeah, like, the, 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 the dental. But it wasn't that he was afraid of getting caught, I don't think. It's that he's afraid of being identified by his teeth. He's scared of some, he's scared of mankind figuring out who his family is. Entity as a I wonder if his family's really, really rich. I wonder if he's like a Rothschild, something like Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton is a Rothschild, but he's like 45th removed or something like that. But I wonder sometimes if some of these people are just trying to have entertaining lives rather than being rich. Convict. When Reefman made a return visit to the dentist in the middle of the night. No, if they're if they're escaping prison, they're 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 career they're career career criminals. Possibly he was simply trying to locate his own dental records, but. I have to blow my nose. I'm too stuffed up. I will be right back. It's funny when um, a 17-year-old girl on heroin tells you that she's your boss now and you're 36. And you realize it's because she was always the cool girl. And she's she's like, you know, and she's pulling that clout. And no matter what, they're always going to make sure that she's always the most important person in the room. And you're like, oh, God. Uh, a 17 year old girl just became my boss and I realized just now how really sad that was that a 17 year old girl became my boss not because I'm sexist or I don't believe that a 17 year old girl can run the world I do like look at Billie Eilish it's just that 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 you know that that uh it's weird that she ended up being my boss because I was like triple her age or something like that I wasn't triple I was like double her age and, and that's weird when they put, like, a kid in charge of you. But that's how fucking talented she was. That's how many connections she had. That's how much money she was making. How much heroin she was, like, doing. It was, it was like, crazy. And she was 17 when I met her. She was a superstar. Everybody in that fucking crew was. Every last person in that fucking crew was, like, a fucking superstar in their own right for very many different reasons. All kinds of crazy reasons. Like one of them was from uh, South Africa, or I'm sorry, no. Um, he was uh, Peruvian. Peruvian. Got to keep it straight. And his name was something that, that distills, it, it instills fear in Americans' hearts when they hear it. When you hear a criminal named what my friend was named, it instills fear in a nasty way. I can't say what it is, but it's really nasty. 
and and um and it, it was his god-given name it was like it wasn't like he went looking for that name that threatens people's lives or anything like that that was his god-given name and, and 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 when you understood that you were his friend because you understood that he was a dreamer and he wasn't from here and he was just trying to make it like everybody else but he didn't even have an identity really you know his original motive he eventually resorted to other than that name that scares the shit out of everybody because when they hear the name it describes to them what they'll do to you in prison you know i'll tell you what his name is like indirectly but i will never never i'll never say it like fucking his name was what they do to you in prison and that name was french and weird and it was a legitimate name too what they do to you in prison when they kill you right that was his actual fucking name he burned the dentist office to the ground yeah, because maybe you couldn't find the record. I mean, it's not his actual name. I, I, I definitely left it too much of a mystery even for a detective to solve. But, I mean, it's close. It's very close to his actual name. And I was like, how did you get this terrible name? I don't want to work with somebody who has a name like this because I'm scared you'll do it to me. And he was like, no, no, no. I come from the old country in, in Peru, and this, this, is, this is my actual name. And you're one of the few people in the world that actually knows that because you're one of the few people in the world that was ever honest to me about, about how scary my name is when you hear it. And he was like, wow, you actually told me. Most people are too afraid to tell me how much that my name scares them. But you told me right away that, that, that <laughs> how much my, my name bothers you. And I was like, yeah, your name, is, it's really unsettling in a, drug, in a drug dealer circle to hear somebody mention your name. Because it kind of sounds like what happens to you in prison after you get busted for drugs. You know, you get killed by somebody with a particular tool. That was what his name was. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to work with somebody whose name is what they do with, to you with shivs in prison. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And, it like, and, and it was scary. It was scary. And it took me a while to understand who he was. He was totally fine. He was not a violent man. He was totally fine. He was just a drug dealer. But, but his name was this terrible provocation thing meant to, to, to strike fear in the hearts of junkies. And it worked, too. Everybody I knew was terrified of him because of his name. Just his name. That was it. There was no other part of his image was scary or hard at all but his name was and it definitely commanded respect it was insane so just by setting it on fire he destroys all what do they do to you with with uh shivs in prison call him shivs i mean that that was his name his name was shivs that's close enough he then i was like are you gonna shiv me in fucking prison and he was like maybe <laughs> on the records which is kind of smart and also a pretty major crime <laughs> Well, that's one way of making sure nobody's ever going to find those. I was like, Shivs is a weird name. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll shiv you. <laughs> Records, you I was like, I believe you. <laughs> he was like, don't ever go to prison and we're fine. And I was like, nope, don't plan on it. <laughs> I remember the conversations. <laughs> when you tell a drug dealer that you don't plan to go to jail, but you actually mean it, they actually listen, I think. A lot of drug dealers hear a lot of bullshit from a lot of people, but when somebody tells them, I'm not going to jail, I'll fucking kill the pig who tries to, to, tries to take me, they listen. I used to say it exactly like that, too. I'm not going to prison, and I'll kill any pig who tries to take me. And they listen. I'm not kidding what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be provocative. That seems very logical, in fact, to me. Like, you know, that's just the actual truth. Like, you know, I will not go to prison for drugs. I will not do that. Not in modern America. No, I will not be part of your downfall of America or your war on drugs and your war on, war on America. I will not be part of it. I will not be part of your weird drug war. I am clean of it. I'm totally fine. I was a drug dealer for two and a half years. I'm still cleaner than you. You're the ones who put the fucking prison people there to torture us, us, us in the first place. And, uh, yeah, that, that drug war, um, that makes you far worse than Pablo Escobar. I say you as American leadership for committing the drug war, committing us to the drug war. You know, uh, 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 a clear and present danger kind of shit from, from Tom Clancy. Uh, you, you put us in that drug war voluntarily and you fuck the, the known southern Latino world and all this stuff. And you, you fuck the cartel and blame them for buying $10 billion of cocaine from them every single year. You want to blame your drug dealer for your kids' problems? I don't fucking... I'm not down with it. Fuck you. I'll fuck anybody who rolls with you. And the records, and the records are in there. It ties me to my previous life. I'm going to have to burn down the dentist's office. Yep, I'm going to burn down the dentist's office because it's the only thing connecting me to, to me in a life of crime, right? So they go, they go and they burn it. They string together all 15 of their laptop batteries and they go and they kill the fucking laptop evidence at the fucking police, pa police impound. They'll do anything. They don't care. One time, I tried to get into the manifold of my friend's Dodge that he got pulled over for sleeping in... 
Uh, and the girl that we had put with him just left him to fall asleep. And I still want to basically kill that girl. It, it, it cost us so much. I, I don't want to kill her at all. But I mean, like, but what she did to our crew was fucked up. She just got out of the car. She was there to fuck the kingpin, take his drugs, take his money, and smoke his, smoke his shit, and make sure that he doesn't fall asleep with shit in the manifold in the middle of Denver on some street, right? That was her only job. She was receiving like $1,000 a day or something to pretty much make sure that he didn't fall asleep and that he didn't fucking do something stupid when he was falling asleep. That was it. That was her only job. So what does she do? She waits until he puts three ounces in the manifold and then, and then she, or I'm sorry, it was a QP. It was a quarter ounce. It was, it was, it was a quarter. It was a, you know, it was a quarter pound. It was, it was, it was, uh, you know, seven goddamn ounces or something. He, he had seven ounces in the manifold, which is where my, my main hook kept his dope. Cause he was a cook, right? He, he believed in old style stuff. So he kept all of his stuff in gas tanks and manifolds and stuff like that. And so he gets pulled over the girl is on his lap when he falls asleep, fucking him, right? When he wakes up, she's gone. The dope in the car is gone. The cops are knocking on the fucking window. There, there's seven ounces in the goddamn manifold, and he gets rolled for six goddamn years. And this is my partner. That was my partner. He was full blown my partner. We were, we were, we were not half and half, but he was like my main, main hook, my main confidant, main partner, and all that, right? And he goes to jail for some odd time, six, ten years, something like that. Right then and there, we, I never saw him again. Probably never will. She disappears with all the dope that was in the car, but she's too stupid to know that there's seven ounces in the goddamn manifold. She could have just popped the goddamn hood if he had trusted her to tell her where the dope was. If she had just done her goddamn job, she would have known that there were seven ounces in the goddamn manifold and she would have robbed him and it would have been fine. I'm okay with that. What actually happened is they towed the goddamn car to the fucking impound and then we spent like two weeks trying to get into the impound to liberate the seven ounces in the manifold. And eventually we had to give up on that because we were aggroing dogs. We were aggroing security. They were watching us come up. We were sneaking up to the fucking fence and trying to cut the fucking fence with chain cutters and shit. I was like, how do you get into the manifold without the car key? And they were like, we don't know. And I was like, we're going to have to bust that motherfucker. Pop it with a fucking pry bar and shit. Have you ever lived Breaking Bad? Because I absolutely the fuck have. I've never seen somebody die. That's it. I've seen all the rest of it. I've seen all the crazy train robbery shit. I've seen all the fucking manifold shit i've seen fucking i've tried to rob police impounds like him i definitely like lived jesse pinkman's life i definitely did and i and my de my dealer was old just like his like my dealer d is exactly like heisenberg there's like pretty much no difference they're basically both chemistry majors they're both geniuses they're both fucking old old as dirt they're they're too old for the scene that they're in they're coughing up blood and shit because they're just too old and they're meth addicts and stuff and, and all this and it's just weird but that was my friend d d went up for six and a half years because she let him just get rolled with like something like an out it was like i don't know it was like he had like 15 little sacks cut up or something in his in his pocket so they rolled him for distribution and he caught like eight years and i never did see him ever again and that, that sucks i mean i talked to him but i never saw him again and i never visited him in, in jail because i didn't stop i mean he, he went to jail and i lost my main hook but by that time my friend a was also my other hook so i just moved to another dealer and went on with my life but like he 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 stopped he completely stopped for like seven years and he expected me to just go back in when i was when you know when he when he got out and i was like oh no i, I have a job and a life and you know, um, somebody that I love and I've got a family and I, I just don't, I've got to take care of my elderly family. I just don't have time to be this crazy young meth addled fucking drug dealer anymore. I just don't have, I, I, I don't have to live my life now. I have to be a real man. I have to pay for all the fucking legal costs. I have to do all the stuff that I, you know, I have to take care of all the problems that I arised in the last 10 years, you know, the, the, that I caused for myself. And he was like, that's okay. I understand. And, and we parted ways, but we spent like two weeks trying to get in that manifold in the fucking, you know, in the fucking, in, in, in the fucking, in the uh, impound lot. And we never did break property. We were very nervous to cut holes in the gate because we figured that was deep, deep, deep felony. So we were very reluctant to actually damage the gate to, that we wanted to get in. But our plan was to run a hole in the fence and run a motorcycle to the manifold 
literally like run a motorcycle to the manifold because we figured the minute like like i'm sorry not manifold but the hole in the fence we were, we were going to run a motorcycle to the hole in the fence and we were going to have have somebody run in there and loot the manifold probably me because i was the second in command so i was i was the one who probably pulled the straw on that one i had to go back and, re and, re and retain that dope not only did i want to retain not, not only did i have to retain that dope to not avoid a, a police charge you know but i wanted to retain the dope just because it's seven ounces of dope it would have been amazing. It was thousands and thousands of dollars that, that would have just been at my command. So I was the one that was chiefly trying to get in that manifold. But then I had the wake-up moment that I always have where I'm like, this is what grown man children do. Grown, grown man children live that, that Heisenberg fantasy of robbing the evidence locker, you know? But real people don't hunt police for raping your friend. Real people don't break into the impound and steal the three ounces of dope from the fucking manifold. Like, like, like when my friend D called, he only said one word. That's it. He said manifold. It, well, he said two words. I think it was. It was he, he called me on the phone a bunch of times and I ignored him a bunch of times. Finally, finally answered the phone. And he says two words. He says manifold impound and hangs up the phone. And I was like, what? And I, I go back and I talk to my friends and I figure out what happened that day. I got the story from the girl and all that happened. I was like, oh my God, there's like seven ounces sitting in the manifold of a crappy Dodge LeSabre or whatever the fuck they're called in, 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 in a manifold in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, you know, fucking, uh, what's it called? Northland, Colorado, which is where he, where he got rolled. And I was like, how good could the North, could the Northland, Colorado impound be? And we found out they're they're pretty fucking good. There's security all over there. There's people with guns all over that place. It, it was actually pretty fucking good. You know, it was hard. It was it was a daunting thing. I thought the best that we could do after I did the assessment and we and we started to cut the hole in the fence. I was like, we're stopping now. We're gonna try and get this car out of impound. If if we didn't know about the dope for seven weeks, the cops don't know about the dope for seven weeks. It's still in the manifold. All we have to do is get the car out problem is we don't own that car the guy in jail owns that car you can't get somebody else's somebody else's car out of the impound and that's how and that's how we lost seven ounces of fucking methamphetamine and on the streets that's like a war crime losing seven ounces of methamphetamine is like a war crime it's like war crime levels of irresponsibility it's 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 so many people like suffered to get that to be what it is and create it and get it where it was and get it bagged up and moved across the country and all this stuff so many people put their lives at risk and all this crap right and i knew right then and there you don't go hunting police even if they did rape your friend and leave her to die naked in a fucking dumpster in littleton you don't go hunting dope in the manifold if it's in the police impound you know breaking bad might you know teach you otherwise but i mean that that manifold dope that was like the the urban legend for like a year we weren't the only ones who knew about it everybody knew about that manifold dope i don't know what happened to that car we never did find out i don't know maybe he got maybe he got it out himself i don't know i don't know what happened to that fucking car but i'm fairly sure they don't keep it in impound longer than like a like a couple of weeks before it just goes to auction and i guarantee whoever bought that car at auction found the seven goddamn ounces of methamphetamine in the manifold it was so well hidden i doubt even the goddamn uh, car car auto the car auto salesman at the at the at the northland uh you know i used to work for the northland car uh, uh car uh, auction and like and i know those i know those kids and i know the work that they do and i doubt they found that seven ounces of dope in the manifold eventually that car was sold at auction with seven ounces of dope in the manifold and now you understand why so many people go to car auctions also, uh, storage locker auctions. Remember, remember all those ones, storage wars, and and all that. That's just how it is. <laughs> That's just how it is. Like occasionally, drug dealers lose ten pounds of dope. It just happens. It, it's like a fact of fucking life. I've seen I've seen it happen like seven times. One time, a dealer handed me like I don't. I think it was like. Uh, yeah, it was an ounce. He handed me an ounce of meth that wouldn't crack up. And that means that it, it just when you burn it, it turns to liquid. It won't turn. It won't turn to vapor or smoke. It only turns to liquid because it's like basically wax. It's not real meth, you know. They call it MSM, 
And like I, the, my my main, that same guy, that same guy, he sold me a, a fucking ounce of a fucking MSM liquid that wouldn't even crack up. And I never forget. I went right back to the motel room, and I was like, "This this dope will not crack up." I, I got I got to the car before I tried to smoke a bowl. And I was like, this dope will not crack up. I want my motherfucking money back. And he was like, here you go. Sorry. And and, I, and he was like, I got to make some phone calls. And he was like, you should sit around and watch me do this. And he called up like five kingpins and fucking reamed their assholes for, for bad dope. It was hilarious. And he, and he wasn't kidding either. He did not want bad dope. They don't like bad dope. It's bad for their business. But I don't know why they all step on the dope anyways. Very shortly afterwards, he broke his own rule by robbing the exact same... They don't like that dope, but they step on the dope all the time. It makes no sense. It's the same thing as America, right? We love drugs, but we commit drug wars all the time. We love drugs. We, we blew $10 billion on cocaine last year. $10 billion. I'm not kidding. We love drugs. We love drugs like we love cocaine. And like we love cocaine like we love water. We, we, we use a lot of it each year as Americans. But yet we want to crucify the goddamn cartel for that. That's like shooting the McDonald's drive through person for selling you a Big Mac. What the fuck does that have to do with it? You like cocaine. America likes cocaine. I despise cocaine. I think it's a horrible drug. And I wouldn't ever recommend it to anybody. It wears off in like 30 minutes. It's, it's worthless. And like, but yet we blow $10 billion on it every year or whatever. And like, and, and I'm sorry, but you put those cartels in power and yet you hunt them like they're like your, like they're your enemy. No, no. Your cocaine dealer is your friend. Pablo Escobar is one of America's best friends. I hate to say it, but it is true. Twice within a month. We blow 10 billion on him every year on the Medellin cartel. Try and pretend that we don't. You think that you need to bust the cartels for this? Nah, get your kids off dope idiots. Short nah, get your kids off the cocaine. Fuck the cocaine. We can brew meth in our own goddamn fifth wheels or whatever, but we can't. But we, but, but we absolutely cannot produce cocaine that easy. No, no, it doesn't grow. It doesn't grow that easy everywhere. Not like marijuana. No. So like, yeah, like you know, I, I'm sorry, but you want to crucify, goddamn, uh, you know, fucking Pablo Escobar for buying cocaine. But I mean, you bought the cocaine. Your senators are buying the cocaine. Your strippers, your Americans, your people, your your people living in the inner cities that are smoking crack and stuff. You buy the cocaine, but yet you want to shoot the fucking dealer. I like Pablo Escobar, honestly. I think he does good business. If he if he kept the guns out of it, and that's America's fault, not his. If he kept the guns out of out of it, it would be a good trade. Medellin make a good good car, cocaine cocaine product, I believe. You know. It's a it's a good trade like McDonald's. It kills people, but it's a good tr it's a good trade. Makes a lot of money. Perhaps fueled by the triumph and ease of his very recent tour, he decided that he might as well. Like like McDonald's, it kills people, but they really really love it. Re Americans really really love gasoline, McDonald's, and cocaine. We really love it. We draw billions and billions on it every year. We we got we got bad vices. Gasoline. I mean, it's all the same stuff, anyways. Gasoline, methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, and uh, and McDonald's. And uh, that sucks, but I mean that is the truth. I don't know why we lie to ourselves and say that we need to hunt Pablo Escobar. That's like shooting the dude for for for, for accepting your Venmo after you pay for cocaine with Venmo, you know. Why would you shoot the dealer who sold you cocaine? You bought the cocaine. All your senators and all your senators' daughters and all the middle class and all the brats, they're doing cocaine, lots of it. Heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine. And uh, we buy that stuff. We buy it wholesale. We spend a lot of money on it. But you seem to want to kill the guy who sells it to us. But, I mean, wouldn't you just normally stop buying it first? Yeah, if you're part of a governmental you know identity that runs on logic but no in this country we just shoot the cocaine dealer and call him a rapist and a murderer and set us back a thousand years in mexican fucking greco relations or whatever the fuck you want to call it you know and i'm sorry but no you're 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 fucking you're 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 your 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 hypocrisy when it comes to drugs killed us it killed this country but on the second occasion Things didn't go as smoothly as it planned. For starters, he barely got his gun out before a female off-duty sheriff's deputy... Oh, good. Female off-duty sheriff's deputy wants to play hero, so she probably put a couple rounds in him. Let's see. Came wandering into the store. Oh, she came wandering in, and he's got to kill her now. 
like Lalo in in uh you know like Lalo at the uh at the uh uh was it the uh the the uh Western Union in um uh, uh, Better Call Saul, right? Lalo has to kill the Western Union guy when he when he crawls up and over the ceiling and into the goddamn Western Union, and then he realizes that he's got to kill the witness or he'll be live on the news in an hour. And then the, 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 and that's that's what this reminds me of is Lalo has to kill the witness now. Bonded to this unexpected visit by punching her in the face and stealing her gun. Yep, punch her in the face, steal her gun, potentially kill her, maybe rape her. I mean, what's the difference? You're a criminal anyways, right? You might as well just go rape her at that point. You're thinking about killing her already. What's the difference? You might as well just rape her at that point. You're a full-blown criminal. You may as well just rape her before you kill her, you know? I'm sorry, but, but some criminality really bothers me. Oh my, but in the meantime... Some of it. He had lost control of the heist. Customers and employees. Yeah, he's were... lost control. He's he's got a cop in the mix now, and and she's like under, like you know, she's under capacity and running around the shop like lemmings and not really doing what they were told. Rupin eventually decided that he needed to sack this one off as a bad job, and at the first opportunity, he discreetly disappeared. <laughs> he's like, oh, look at this wild scene. I've got to get out of here. These people are going to put me in jail. Search behind the bike racks. He couldn't trigger the fire alarm this time, as there were too many people milling around in panic, and witness what. Was later revealed to the police that nobody had seen him leave via the front or back of the building. Uh-oh. For the first time, the police began to suspect that the robber hadn't gone very far at all. Uh-oh. Can you imagine? Yep, they're like, wait, is he still here? Sitting there and your baby must have been like, oh, God, here we go. Here we go. Following the exhaustive examination of the toy store, the secret passageway to the villain's den next door was finally uncovered. It was no sign of the robber himself. It appears that Roofman had decided he was no longer safe in Circuit City. Smart man. But he certainly hadn't left in a hurry and didn't have much time to tidy up. Police found surveillance equipment, the discarded baby food containers, the basketball hoop, and approximately $6,800 worth of stolen toys. I can't quite comprehend what kind of clowns are carrying out the dick. Oh, yeah. stock checks at Toys R Us. Oh, I can. I can imagine them because they work in every single fucking sector. These people that are totally blinders on have no idea what their job is or what they're there to do. They don't care what you steal. I used to, uh, I used to like have some friends who like to snowboard and stuff. I was a skateboarder, but they were snowboarders, and I did snowboard quite a bit for a couple of years. But it was a rich man's game, in my opinion. Snowboarding is, it's, it's like you have to spend five hundred dollars on a lift ticket every year. And that's really expensive. So, I had these friends that liked to snowboard, and, and they liked clip bars and stuff like that when they were going snowboarding. So, I would be working, because I'm the poor class boy, I'm the lower class boy, so I'm working my, my graveyard shift, so I can maintain my daytime lifestyle with my, with, with my, with my more, more, uh, you know, more successful friends, friends who have more money and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and so they're, they, they're going snowboarding, and so at 4, 4, you know, 4.30 in the morning, I have my friend Jay come through with the entire crew, and I'm like, alright guys, it's open season season at the BP gas and wash every bit of the food is entirely up to, to grabs take yourselves a good good bounty for your wonderful snowboard journey this is one of, my, one of my favorite things I ever did and they're like what dude and I'm like yep just go ahead the, these people do not check for theft you can just take whatever you want fill the car you know and they did they filled the goddamn car they stole like I don't know, four thousand dollars worth of shit right off the goddamn aisles. They left food on the, on the fucking, you know, on the fucking, on the, on, on the aisles, so you could, so the store still had like enough, you know, surplus to still look like a store. But if it was good, they took it, all of it, from cigarettes to food to water to Red Bull and Monster. You've never, you never lived until you've had a Seven Eleven shopping spree where a cashier tells you that you've got open reign to just walk out of the store with whatever you want. And so you just go piecing through the Seven Eleven, just taking whatever you want. And my friends will never forget me for stuff like this. They'll never forget me. Other people, they're going to forget, but they'll never forget me. You know, I'm not one of those guys anybody ever forgets. I've never had that kind of luxury. People don't ever really forget me, you know? It's one of the reasons why I'm not a criminal. When I worked at a branch of Global Video. And so, yeah, they filled up, like, you know, $3,000 worth of food or something like that. They went to snowboarding, and they lived off it for, like, four days. And I was like, yeah, you know, cool. And, and when, when, when my boss came in, 
They didn't even notice that $3,000 worth of shit or whatever it was. It was like condoms and cigarettes and lighters, a pack of lighters and, you know, anything for drugs like, like Brillo or anything like that. Anything for drugs at all. Anything for food, ice cream, ice cream bars, chocolate bars, candy, you know, chips, tons of chips, like 30 bags of chips. They just filled the back of the fucking van with chips, you know, like 30 bags of chips or something like that and you think that they might notice but no no completely under the radar three thousand dollars worth of fucking theft and 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 they're lecturing you all the goddamn day about how you're slow to 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 do the pricing and you're slow about you know getting stuff out on the shelf and you're not facing stuff and turning stuff around but when it comes to missing three thousand dollars worth of condoms cigarettes lighters chocolate food chips I mean, you can see that the, the, the shelves are light. You can see it as, as they left. I was like, I think I made a mistake and I might get fired. I remember thinking that. I was like, I might get fired here because my friends just kind of ransacked my, my job and stole everything that there was to steal. But no, the clueless asshole who's 48 comes in, unlocks the store in the morning and, and spells you so you can go home. And they don't even do the inventory at all, so they don't know if there's something missing or anything like that. They're paying some kid $15 to do that. So then eventually, two weeks later, the kid mentions that you're out of chips and the owner is like, what? Yeah, nobody ordered any chips. Oh, well, then order some chips then, you lazy fuck. That's their response. They don't even think about the missing chips. They're like, order some chips then. I mean, th this is this is what my, my, my parents are like. This is what their generation was like. They spend with careless abandon, assuming ter uh, eternal supply. It is funny how often you can literally get them to verbally commit that to you. So you're saying that I can take anything? And they'll often be like, yeah, you can just take anything. It's fine. The would really at the fan if it turned out that a single bag of crap popcorn was missing. Yep. And so I did that twice before I never did it again. I was like, I cannot let my snowboarder friends get ready for the mountains with my 7-Eleven job or my BP gas and wash job, you know? They, like, I can't let my friends steal $3,000 every time that they go s snowboarding. I'll be out of this job and in jail so quick, you know? But I was really actively working to pretty much empower my generation and only my generation... To, to get through the mess that they left us after 9-11. And that's why I let my friends do stuff like that. Nobody had any money for chips. It, it was post 9-11. Nobody had any jobs or money or anything like that. The country was a piece of shit. There was nothing left. We, we were like, our best hope was to go to college. That was it. There was no hope after that. And I was like, sure, steal the chocolate. In five years, this BP gas and wash won't even be here. And yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. Been on duty that it's day. gone. It's gone. In five years, this gas station won't even be here. Who cares if somebody steals Doritos from it while it's still here? I really don't care. That's a terrible criminal's logic that you can't live by. But it is true. It is a truism. The chips didn't matter. Just like the high school. I broke into the high school and stole the chemistry set and all of the fucking, you know, I, with, with all my friends, we broke into the high school in C, in, 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 at the end of junior year. And I got expelled from, I got expelled from my high school because of this. And I failed, the, or I failed, the, I didn't fail a grade because of it, but I, but I had to go, go to senior year at a different high school because I had been expelled, you know, and I got expelled for breaking into my high school back then. We were so desperate to do anything that wasn't the establishment or being told what to do or being average or anything like that, that stealing from the high school was encouraged by the parents, I would say. My mother even kind of encouraged me to do it, I would say. Not that she's a bad person and she didn't encourage me to do it, but she enabled me to continue being around afterwards, particularly because they knew how fucked up it was for us. I don't know what, I think it was 9-11 or something like that, but they knew how fucked up it was for all of us. We were all crazy drug addicts crazy drunk at the age of like 14 crazy smoking a pack of cigarettes by the age of 13 a day i was smoking a pack of cigarettes by the age of 13 i had gravel voice by the age of 17 i was a methamphetamine addict by the age of 19 you know and i don't know like it was just kind of crazy the, the reality that they built wasn't too good so we just sort of started looking for other places for reality whether it was drugs or sex or porn or politics or punk rock or music or sublime or, or it didn't matter what it was we just you know we we chased anything that wasn't them and the and the death of humanity because to me uh my parents pretty much killed humanity 
I believe they did. I think they committed a lie with 9-11 to kill 3,000 of our own troops and permitted us to, to wage war against the Middle East for 20 years, which was, to me, the death of America, right short of the war on drugs, which was the other war that we were engaged in. We had a war overseas with, with, with people that we said bombed our building, and then we had a war at home with anybody who was poor. And I really hate them, and I don't care if they lose their money. I don't care if banks go tits up. I don't care if there's great depressions. I don't care if the stock market crashes. I don't care if somebody nukes DC. I actually, I actually kind of really don't view, I view this as a failed experiment. I kind of, I, I care and I love, and I would fight. I would fight those things from happening. But do I, but I do I consider them foregone conclusions? Yes, because we turned our backs on what America truly was, which was Americans. We said that cocaine addicts were evil, heroin addicts were evil, prostitutes were evil, drug dealers were evil. We said that, you know, the other side of the aisle is evil. We said that co other countries were evil, that we fear China and Russia and Mexico and all this stuff. We have been behaving like, like rich white people behaving badly for a long time, a bab, a bigot acting badly. We've been, we've been bab for a long time, like since 2007 or something. We've been bab. We were rich people behaving badly. You know, bigots acting badly. And, and, and I don't know how to solve all this. I just know that if I don't care, if I don't talk, if I don't tell you what the reality was, if I don't tell you why I don't love you anymore and why I won't vote for you anymore and why I don't, cons why I don't consider you a friend anymore, then, then nothing fixes, right? So I sit around and I tell you that you killed us with the high prices. You killed us with the high rent. You took over all the 10 things that we need to survive, like rent, food, water, shelter, education, childcare, all that other stuff, and you raised the price of diapers and, and baby food. You want to know why this guy was able to steal $600,000 of, of, of stuff from, from Toys R Us is because he was eating $17 bottles of baby food. And he probably ate like 4,000 of them or something like that, right? Probably two or three a day for, for five years or something like that. What is that? That's three. That's 365 times three is 1,500 a year for like five years or something like that. Yeah, like, like he honestly probably ate like 7,000 or 8,000 bottles of baby food, which is just frankly... a. a a moral thing that, that that begs so many questions like do you not like babies would you rather eat food than babies eat food with i mean all this other stuff right but i mean that's just what he had access to at the time when you get to you get an idea of how really depraved and deep they'll go they'll steal they'll, they'll live off the baby food as they hide in the toy aisle in the circus city that's been shut down next door like me in the burnt out restaurant right if they will if they will live in the burnt out restaurant to survive the apocalypse they will live in the burnt out restaurant to survive the apocalypse and, and love in the time of covid walk out for any missing items out of their own pocket that's such a policy of like companies where they're like yeah 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 if you break it you have to pay for it yeah if you like screw something up you have to pay for it it's like you have to pay like, for it isn't the reason like isn't the reason that you want want this money is because you're selling me something if the thing that you sold me breaks all the time why do I need to pay that cost? It's kind of like software. Software is like that. You constantly think that the people need to pay the cost of you doing bad business as Microsoft or, or IBM in, in the Holocaust or whatever. And, and they do. They pay the cost of you doing bad business. Like every time that Windows takes like three and a half minutes to load up, that's another three and a half minutes of a lifetime that's stolen, you know? And I've seen Windows fire up in under three seconds, but but not for the consumer, only for, for, for the developer. That you get to make more money. Only for the developers, never the consumer. I don't really, that doesn't really make sense. The people that made you rich are the people that you bone. Than me, because you bear the risk going wrong. Yeah, you bear the risk of that item going wrong. You are the business. Why should I take the cost of you being a software developer in the fucking ass every single day? Every time Windows fucking fails me or something can't load or a game can't run or OBS can't translate and it's, and it's fra frazzled or, or ugly or something like that. Why is it my fault as the consumer every single time your fucking product fails? I've got to buy a new copy every time a, a laptop fails. I had to buy four Xbox 360s for, for every single time one red ringed. I had to buy four PlayStation 2s at $729 for each time one red ringed. And that's you cat caught you know, passing the cost of doing business on the consumer. I bitch about this all the time. Why is that my problem?
Isn't that the whole point of like? Isn't that the whole point of dem of, of of essentially not democracy, but essentially capitalism? Is that you bear the cost? You're bringing something to market. You need that thing to come to market th to be good. Why is it my fault that your laptop failed or your Xbox 360 failed or your OBS failed and now I've got to buy a new video card or a new laptop or something like that? No, you just didn't actually fix your product. Like capitalism. Like capitalism. Like why is it my fault as a consumer that you don't know how to make like, you know, uh, a good software development program, you know? Why, are, why isn't there a program out there that lets you develop Microsoft Windows? for yourself we have the ai to do something like that but it doesn't ever happen because you're happier with failure than you are with success you hear all the time about them bailing out the farmers with subsidies and stuff like that the current politicians are happier with failure and, and a loss of budget and trying to lie about the budget than they are about a actual success for all of its flaws is like yeah okay so the person in charge Control. Yeah, the tr person in charge has a lot of money and they're in charge and they have a lot of power, but they also have a responsibility to bring a product to the market that is to their ability the best product that that product could be so as to, f to stimulate a lot of spending and a lot of money, right? But, but that's not how software is. You, the way that you design Windows and all these piece of shit softwares is like you're trying to scare the fucking buyer away. You know, literally Windows scares people away. It doesn't inspire buyers or investors. It scares people away because you develop this so badly. It makes no sense. It's like, shouldn't you necessarily need to make Windows the best possible thing that it could ever possibly be? If you expect it to keep putting butts in the seats and money in the bank account five or six generations later, does not Windows and Blizzard and Square Enix and fucking, you know, ZeniMax and, and, and all these other companies and shit, Face Puncher and shit, don't those companies need to be the best company that they could possibly be the entire time that they're a company? Pretty much, yeah, I would say so. But nah, you have us you have them shortchanging americans and fucking us on video cars and fucking us on gasoline and fucking us on rent and fucking us on education and fucking americans and taking all of their money like the piece of shit traitor goddamn backstabbing money grubbing war profiteers that you actually are you're not americans you're looking to fuck us on the next fucking you know on the next fucking uh, uh financial hustle you know, like Ameri like American hustle is like ab scam is is more American than than the lemonade stand. Um, ab scam the the movie American Hustle is more American now than Lucy and and Charlie Brown trying to sell lemonade at the Peanuts fucking lemonade stand. What happened here? You're not Americans. You're fucking traitors. You're capitalist fucking piece of shit stooges that sold this country out. And I'm not pushing some fucking shitty, you know, uh communist reality i'm saying that your greed killed our country how we are continuing a greed system is beyond me that's sort of like saying well the house burned down because of the fire system that we run so here's more fire more fire more poverty more debt the the, the country burned down and the bank stole all the money so the uh, the solution to the poverty is more bank crashes Basically. The solution to the house of America burning down to the fucking ashes is 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 more is more predatory banking and, and more and more theft, more grifting, more more griftonomics and and rug pulls and Bitcoin pulls. That's why they get more money. And then they're like, and, no. and corporatocracies and all this. No, no. The solution to greed is not more money. No, no. The solution to greed is not capitalism. It is sharing. If you share everything so much that nobody wants for anything, you don't need capitalism. Nobody needs to buy anything. There's nobody's hungry. Nobody's thirsty. Nobody's wanting for, for anything. Government's doing well. You got a literal, literal utopia on earth. Your only fear is neighbors that haven't evolved like you, right? And that's America, right? So, I mean, I don't understand why you think that capitalism was the solution to capitalism. I think it's actually maybe getting rid of that, that capitalist price fixing that killed our country. And I'm sorry, I've, I've got to go to the restroom. I'll be back.
Okay. you like screw something up you have to pay for it it's like wait isn't the reason that you get to make more money is you? yeah because you bear the risk going wrong isn't yeah. that the whole point of like yes like yes capitalism. yes all of its flaws is like yeah okay so the person in charge controlling all the things they take the risk that's why they get more money and then they're like no nah, i don't want to take the risk either <laughs> that's just being a but over at Toys R Us, it appears that thousands of dollars worth of toys could gradually go missing over the space of a few months. And it was all just chalked up to rotten bad luck. Uh, yeah, and it's also way more than $6,800. <coughs> it's just like in his little den. Hasn't he been giving all that money and, like, all those toys to children in the church and the, uh, the children of his girlfriend and all this stuff? Jeez. Ruthman's own luck was about to run out. The police were, of course, on the hunt for the mystery. Because these people, they're, they're, they're not bad people when it comes down to it. They will, they will take care of the kids in their community and all that. They're just cursed with this brain that won't stop. And the brain led him to, to, to steal. Fugitive Jeffrey Manchester. He should be in jail for the 45 years, too. I think that's actually perfect. I think he got, for once, we actually got the sentence that he needed. You know? In a later search of the cell he had so gr ungraciously vacated, officers discovered that Jeffrey had spent a lot of time drawing up plans for what appeared to be his dream home. This wasn't your usual kind of multi-million dollar mansion with a private swim pool, helicopter pad, and a Star Trek pinball machine in the adjoining arcade hall. No, it's a place that you can go where all the people whose stuff you stole can't get at you. Have I mentioned that I really want a Star Trek pinball machine? <laughs> no, I don't want a Star Trek pinball machine. I want uh, Simpsons arcade uh, the Simpsons arcade cabinet. That 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 game changed our lives at some point because that's something I do want. Jeffrey seemed far more interested in drawing up plans for elaborate mazes with secret passageways and trapdoors and escape holes and hideouts, almost as if he were drawing up architectural plans for a house which he might be able to escape from himself. It didn't take long for the police to identify a connection between the missing roofman and a familiar style of art. This was such a good game, the Simpsons arcade opening, right? No, this was the arcade, but the arcade intro, right? Yeah. Ram rom check. This is probably DMCA for some reason. Not the diamond, not Mr. Smithers. Mr. Smithers is evil in this one. Oh, Maggie, Maggie! All five of them saying that at once. It was like it was like such a uh, an advanced thing. Maggie, downtown Springfield, bitch. Yeah, Maggie.
Oh man, Purple Suit was really angry. I forgot about Purple Suit. He was like really an angry dude. He was like the Frank Grimes of, 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 the, of the Simpsons arcade game. See, he's so angry. He's like, I'm gonna get this kid. Bleh. He looks so evil. Who wears purple with a blue tie? I don't know why Simpsons had a weird, like, it's weird that he's all blue. I remember the trees, they would drop apples. Let's go for it, man! It would just keep going, and then eventually, eventually some dude with a sign comes rolling out, and he's like, all gone, get lost. All gone, beat it. See it? Alright, let's go for it, man! That was a big deal at the time, hearing the characters talk. Like, like I think that's how we got Skyrim, is, is, is the Bart Simpson talking on the Simpsons arcade machine. I'm not kidding. <laughs> that's actually moding, and that's and that's very close to the television show, too. And so, like, you know, and that stuff was just unheard of at the time. Characters that talked, that, that was an amazing feat. This guy sucked. I hated this guy. He was a quarter stealer. Like, so if you take other people in, his help bar just quadruples. So then it takes longer and then you just get stomped more because he's just doing all these cycles of moves that can't be blocked. Like he comes smashing down with his belly because he's a wrestler and stuff. And if you have four people, it takes four times as long. So then he does four unblockable attacks and he steals four times the amount of quarters. Right? And so we used to be actually sort of against other people playing the game uh, uh, for bosses. We used to let people jump, jump in and jump out because it didn't, it didn't matter if, if your press start ended, if you weren't trying for the top score. So then we would let, like, like little sister would pop in and play for half a level and then we would let, like, she would die naturally. And you would have her quit out because it would make the boss much harder. And he has, un he has unblockable attacks that just chunk you for, like, a quarter of your bar. See how the help bar is actually fairly, actually fairly, like, detailed for an 80s game? Look at how this help bar is. It's like a ruler, and it's like how a ruler would be with, like, you know, 6, 12, 18, 24 inches or whatever, or 12 inches, or, you know, 3, 6, 9, 12 inches or whatever. And, like, this help bar is no joke. And so if this guy lands on you, it's like a quarter of your bar. It's like from this line to this line. And that sucks when there's four of you because it does double damage. And the game actually got harder the more people that you tried to bring in. But the more people that you tried to bring in, there was more people fighting the boss. Which was kind of cool. So it's like if you needed a break, you were low health or, or he was going to combo you or something. Somebody else would come smooth, shooting in on a skateboard or, or, or like, you know, with a vacuum cleaner or something. And they would take over the boss for a little bit because their health bar was full. And I think, I think this game was kind of like one of, like this and Golden Axe were one of the first few instances of, of like tanking the Holy Trinity. Because uh, Homer Simpson was kind of a tank. He had, he had like, he had the same health bar that everybody else did. But he was like, he was like bigger. He was like bigger. His hitbox, his hitbox was bigger, and I think he did more damage and stuff. So Homer Simpson would come in as a tank, and then Lisa and Bart and Matt and, and Marge would run around vacuuming and skateboarding, and I forget what Lisa did. I think it was a, a trombone or a saxophone. I think yeah, it was a saxophone. She and like and so the the three little guys like like Marge wasn't little, but Bart Bart and Lisa were, and so so everywhere Homer went, there would be you know Lisa, Marge, and Bart running around trying to get Homer to tank the boss and i and i i i i really fundamentally remember this game being very very deep for its time in that respect like somebody who was more skilled than you could come in on on like homer simpson and because he was bigger he could land hits on the boss that bart couldn't do and he had he, and his special attack was like the belly bump and it was like really powerful i think it was the strongest thing in the game and so like 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 i remember i very distinctly remember 
instances of people tanking in the arcade for me. They would come in on, on Homer Simpson on a game that they had beaten before already. And I'd be like, I haven't beaten this game. And they were like, oh, well, I have. I'll show you. I remember in the malls this would happen. I remember during during summer camp they had the Simpsons arcade machine because they were selling it. So we just gravitated to the machine for all 72 hours of the fucking thing from like Friday afternoon at 2.30 p.m. until like 7 or 8 o'clock at night we were on the Simpsons machine. Same same except the minute that we got there in the morning on Saturday it was like 9 10 in the morning or something like that my friend Christopher and I and his sis, his sister uh, went running to the Simpsons machine and we clocked 14 hours on the Simpsons machine when I was eight years old or something like that because it started at like nine and it ended at like I don't know it was like t well, it wasn't 14 hours it was like 12 hours it, it started at nine in the morning and it went until dark which in, in in Jersey dark is like I don't know sometimes as late as 10 30 something like that so it's sort of sort of weird and, and it depends on the summer summer it's, it's earlier or is it later? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's later in the summer. So, you know, so they would let us stay up later in the summer. And I remember doing all three days uh, on, on, on the Simpsons arcade machine and thinking the entire weekend that, tur that Street Fighter 2 Turbo was a better game and that I wanted that instead. And so did my friend Christopher. And I was... Uh, I believe I was six years old. Uh, this this memory is very, very, very detailed, but it is. I think video game memories are more detailed than, than normal memories. It's kind of insane. But I remember this. I remember being six years old when we went to the summer camp for the weekend. Because we used to go to summer camp. They would keep you there for like three weeks and stuff. But then uh, going up to the summer camp and leading out of it, they would have like school-wide events where the entire school and all their family would show up for like summer camp. Uh, summer summer camp vespers or something like that. I don't know what it would be. But like, you know, you would, sh you would show up. And, 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 and we would show up. And, and this machine was there one year miraculously. And not only that, but it was also unlocked. And so we could just slide one quarter. I'll never forget it. It blew my mind. Ever since then, I've been a snob. When I got complete access to an arcade game, it made me a snob. And I was like, okay, well, there's no reason why I should ever pay for an arcade game ever again. Because I've seen what it actually is, which is like, I run a quarter past a little runner thing. And it tells me that I pay. It tells the machine that I paid. And all that is, is just the start button. It's the same thing as a Super Nintendo that doesn't limit you at all. It's, it's exact, I mean, Super Nintendo was better than most of the arcade cabinets, to be honest. It was actually better. So, you know, and, and so I was like very against paying for arcade machines anymore in, in, the, in the era of, not, of, of the original 8-bit Nintendo. When we were playing games like Duck Hunt, Super Mario Brothers 1, 2, and 3, and like, you know, uh, Act, or sorry, not Act Razor, that was later. It was, uh, there was a bunch of NES games that I can't remember, like Contra, Marble Madness... Dr. Mario, Super Metro, sorry, Metroid... Uh, there was a lot of Nintendo games that I thought were superior because they, they didn't steal your quarters. And there was this point where my parents were like, you have like a $30 a weekend habit at the fucking arcade cabinet. And they were like, we can't continue to pay $120 a month for, for a seven-year-old to like to play arcade machines. They warned me about it. They were like, we know that you're stealing quarters from your father's fucking thing in the car. And we know that you're only thinking about quarters. And we know that you, that, 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 that money only comes in increments of quarters to you because the only thing that you care about is quarters. Right. That's literally like, like that. I had to sit down with them one day and they had, they, they, they had to tell me that I had obsessed about quarters so badly that I didn't know how to do real math. And then they taught me how to do, adding and subtraction and multiplication and division with pennies and i ended up being the top multiplication mathematician in my class over over interesting people that were raised by their parents to defeat dumb fat white kids such as the wonderful my wonderful friend francis who was the math whiz and she probably is now in a math some kind of math job i imagine now but i remember my friend francis for uh the first like you know six years of my school and Francis and I were in constant competition, and she was the smart girl who was Asian, who was expected to beat my fat, white, lazy ass who played too much video games and didn't care about math. And But I did consistently outdo her sometimes on stuff like multiplication... 
I just knew knew earlier because my parents were like, the only increment that you know anymore is a quarter, and we need you to understand like multiplication and division and stuff like that because you don't understand it. And they were like, we feel that because video games don't teach you how important multiplication is, you don't know what it is. So we're going to give you a, they gave me like, I don't know, like 800 pennies or something. And they were like, what is five pennies times two pennies? And I was like, seven pennies. And they were like, nope, it's two groups of five. How much is that? That's, that's 10. Okay, well, what's three groups of five? Oh, well, that's 15. And then and then my mother's like, well, you've conquered multiplication. You know how to do it now. What's five times three? And I would say, oh, what you just asked me is, five, is 15. And then I, and she would be like, what's five times four? And I would like, well, it's five more. That would be 20. And she was like, you are, you are very good at math. You just don't apply yourself or care, you know? And, and then later on, she tried to tell me that I was bad at math. But, but I mean, she taught me the lesson that I was good at math. And so I and, and that I could do multiplication instantly and I could outdo the 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 cute little Asian girl who was pressured by her her con super nuisance foam parents to outdo the lazy rich fat white kid, you know, and I would still give her challenges and beat her at speed at speed chess and and speed uh, mathematics. And I'll never forget my friend Francis or my friend Neha. My friend Neha was was the was the native. I'm sorry, the uh, the uh, the Hindu girl. And my friend Francis was um, uh, Singa uh, Sing uh, no, not Singapore. It's uh, uh, Sri Lankan. And they were both genius little girl, little girls. They were genius little girls. They probably took over the world, frankly. There some of them probably are probably be best math mathematicians and scientists and stuff. But they were genius little girls in their own rights. Like they, like I uh, they intimidated me back then. They would be doing stuff like that challenged me. Like I I struggled with twelves. Like I can do 12, 24, 36, 48. But beyond that, I don't know. What is forty eight? What is it after forty eight? You can hear you can hear the Aspergers break my brain. I can do 12, 24, 48. I can do 36 and 72 and 96 and 108. But something about certain batches of Baker's Dozen 12s broke my brain. So she would beat me on stuff like that. But then other stuff that mattered, like my parents paid me an, uh, uh, paid me a Super Nintendo allowance for a couple of years because it took me two years to raise the money to buy a $129 you know, Super Nintendo. And I was making $15 an hour, but I was buying other things like candy and comic books and stuff like that right and so my mom paid me fifteen dollars uh um uh, a month it was fifteen dollars a month so i knew exactly what it was a year and I, I knew exactly what i could reach and what i couldn't and it would take me an entire year to save up for super nintendo's while i was also buying candy and comic books and video games and all this other stuff and so and she paid me in increments of 15. So now I can count 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90, 100, 500, 20, 135, 150, 185, 160, I'm sorry, 165, 180, 100, uh, 195. I start to lose the past there. 210, 225, 240, 255, 270, 285. It just goes there for some reason. Or I'm 275, 285, uh, 295, excuse me. Uh, and and, and I, like, you know, I, I can just count like that quickly if the numbers matter to me in some way or form it's kind of like when they talk about fucking up the count on um the wire they're like how can you not do this math homework but you don't fuck up the count and the little poor little clocker kid he's like well they don't beat your ass if you fuck up the math but they do beat your ass if you fuck up the count you know and that was kind of my life I, if the math applies to what i'm doing i can calculate what 699 thousand two hundred and thirty is times seven that's going to be four million seven hundred and eighty nine thousand six hundred and thirty something like that and i'm wrong i'm totally wrong and i'm off like by something like a hundred thousand but i'm within a hundred thousand and i'm close and the problem and the difference is you would need a calculator to go figure out that number but i can do that fast when i need to and i can get i can guarantee what i can tell you what i think my hit's going to be when i crit somebody like, for instance, when I crit somebody and it's 10x, I know that if I if I normally hit for 43,785, but I 10x crit him, that's 400, and, you know, 4,380,785 or something like that. If the math is fast for me if I actually use it. If it's not math that I use, I've compartmentalized my fucking, uh, you know, uh, what's that bad religion song? It's uh, 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 21st century digital boy brain. I tell my 21st century digital boy brain that I don't need math that I don't use. So that's how I, I can count backwards and in, in increment increments of nine numbers but i can't tell you what 12 times eight is 
I still can't. What is that? I think it's 96, right? Yes, yeah, 96 is eight. Uh, 12, 12, uh, yeah, 12 times eight would be 16. So I know that it's 96, and that's how I know it's 96. Is because 12 because because eight times two is 16. That's how I know that it's 96. I don't know what 12 plus 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 12 is like a good mathematician. I only know that 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 the eight eight times two is six 16. So I know that it's 96 because that's the only number that 12 counts to within. You understand how broken my Asperger brain is. Sometimes my brain will 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 quickly reach information that it doesn't actually know i don't know why but it will it'll just sub in and it'll tell me that 12 times t i don't know what 12 times 8 is but i can tell you that it's 96 because 12 times 2 is 16 right and but i don't know what 12 times 8 is i don't know that 12 times 8 is 96 because i can't add 12 eight times i can only go to about uh what i mean 12 12 24 36 48 72 right is the is the highest I can count to twelve before my random access fucked up Asperger's brain just can't do it and that's when the young cute Asian designer girl fucking slaughters me but she says you still have a good brain you can still out count me you can reach information faster than I can if you care if you don't care then I'll slaughter you and I've gotten this from smart people all of my life. I get it from my best friends all the time. They know that I'm faking information, but it's not that I don't know. Well, it is that I don't know what 12 times 8 is. I don't know what 12 times 8 is, but I know that the answer is 96. Isn't that weird? And I don't, I don't know what 12 times 8 is. I, I can tell you the answer is 96, but I still don't believe it because I can't count to 12. I can't count 12s to 96. I, I don't have the power to do it. I know that 12, 24, 36, 48. Then I have to do the math, right? I have to remember that it, the next 12 get, gets me to 60. I have not memorized that, that 60 is 12 times 5. I, I can't memorize that. I don't know why, but I know that 12 times 5 is 60 because 12 times 4 is 48. 48 plus 12 is, is, is 60. And I don't know why it's, it's, it's boggled doctors, it's boggled, you know, learning, you know, treatment people. Sometimes people tell me things and I can absorb it so much faster than anybody else can. Like, for instance, like if they tell me what it's like to go through a court date and what, what I'm going to see, if I can see visually in my mind what they're talking about, I would fairly say that, it, that we basically managed to get a complete replication of what a court date might be like, even though I might not, not have ever been there or, or what, what, what swimming might be like if I had never swam or what, what 60 might be if I can't count past uh, 48 on, on a, on a 12 die. Right, I or what ninety six might be on the twelve die if I can't count if I can't count past past forty eight, but then you know, but then I remember hard ones like so. Then I nailed the the the, the math test though, because the math test is like what's twelve times two. 24 what's 12 times 3 36 what's 12 times 4 48 what's 12 times 5 is 60 what's 12 times 7 is 72 what's 12 times 8 is 90 what's you know what's what's fucking you know to, you know whatever it is um, uh, 84 84 excuse me and then 96 and then uh you know and then i can't i still can't count it but i can remember it so well right and 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 and, and, and smart people can tell that i'm not faking i just have brain damage I've had brain damage all of my life. It's some kind of Asperger's brain damage where I just can't reach the same thing that you reach by the same... Like, for instance, I don't think of 12 times... Uh, uh, 12 times 8 is 96. I think of it as 16 plus, plus, plus 8. Does that make sense? Is I think of it as 16 with a carryover of 8 in, 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 the, uh, in the tens place. Which is really fucking weird. That's like skipping the math entirely. But it is faster, which is how I beat out math whizzes all the time at their own game. It is faster, but it is it doing the math. No. All, all, all my life I would say I have taught my brain to not do any work that it doesn't have to do. Does that make sense? I, I, I've, I've understood that, that I only have so much bandwidth for so many games, so many albums, so many people, so many lives, so many heroes, so many 
games, so many fucking albums, so many fucking lives, so many fucking people. It just goes on. Like like everything in goddamn pop culture ref pop culture reference. If I liked it at all, I fucking memorized it. But that is entirely unnecessary information to survival. So all the time, I, I'm telling my brain to de to deprioritize information that might be useful in a particular situation, is such as what is twelve times eight. But I still don't know what twelve times eight is. I know the answer is ninety six, but I know that I can't count to ninety six and twelves. I can't go. I can't count to twelve beyond forty eight or something like that because I have a I have a dog brain. I've I've got a bad brain. I got a bad brain that the, 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 the gawks at trying to do simple things like what 12 times 5 is. It does. It's like, okay, I know it's 60 because I know that 5 times 2 is 10. And I know that, you know, and that's how, that's how the mathematician would tell you to arrive at the answer as well. But all of us know how to count 12s. To, to, by the time you're 40, you generally know that 12 times 5 is 60, right? I don't. I can't actually prove that. I can't, I can't count to 60 in 12s. My, my brain is completely fucked. I can do it in 15s because they taught me to do it at a young age. But I mean, I, I, I still sh even struggle with that past 200 or something like that because it, because I just don't ha I, I can add and I can do complex algebra and, and algorithms and math and all kinds of crazy stuff in my head without the paper and without the goddamn calculator. And I can get within a thousand or a hundred thousand, depending on what the fucking what the fucking mean curve is. But I'll never nail it perfectly because I just don't care to retain the the goddamn information long enough to memorize it does it make sense i don't care to retain the information long enough to memorize it there is so much goddamn information in the world if you were trying to get stuck on what the what you can you can really get stuck on counting 12 increments as high as you could go you could be like here i'll, I'll show you how far i can do it it'll be like 12 24 36 48, 60, 72, uh, 84, 96, 108, 120, 132, 150, nope, 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 148, no, uh, see, I got to 132 before I just don't know anymore. You're going to realize that I was faking most of the information that I cleared on a, 14, on a 1490 SAT. Not only might you not know how to calculate for the lowest common denominator in reality, but you, you might know how to do it in 12 different ways. You can ace the test, but you don't know how to do it in reality because your brain is broken and backwards. And so you don't worry about doing trigonometry of what what uh, what the square root of 137 is, which I, I believe would be, you know... 41.6 well, I mean I don't know what's the square root of what's the square root of of and this one really scares me 137 really square scares me a lot because 7 is a bad number right the square root of 137 is 11.7 I was so far off do you see how my brain completely broke I was like 40.16 or something like that and it's like no no a quarter of 140 is like 12 or no 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 wait no the square root of 137 is not 11, is it? Oh, no, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm thinking, and I completely forgot what a square root was. I was thinking denominators. I'm terribly sorry, but yeah, like, you know, and I, like, you know, but, and, and the information is worthless to me unless I need to pull it up and use it for something. I've got it in my brain and I can pass these tests and I did all my life without studying, but, 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 but I don't record the information because I don't use it. It's in my brain. It's in there in some memory file, but as to the usage in my life, it's like zero. I don't need to know the square root of 137, so I make the guess of 41 because I'm like four times four is 16. 16 isn't too hard, isn't too far from 160 is not that far from 137, so I made a guess of what was it? Uh, I said a square root of 137 would be 41.6, right? But no, the square root of 137 is 11.7 because I completely forgot what a square root is. I am not incapable of doing a square root really fucking well. <laughs> but I forgot what a square root is. And I think I, I used to forget before I even had brain damage because it's not useful for to me in the, mo in the moment, you know?
armed robbery carried out by a man who lived in a small escape hole next door which could be accessed by a secret passage. But it was a simple tin of empty paint which provided the crucial evidence. After sprucing A simple tin tin of empty paper, is that what you said? Who lived in a small escape hole next door which could be accessed by It's always the the devils in the details, it's always the little things that sink you. Let's hear what let's let's hear what what clued the cops. A secret passage. But it was a simple tin of empty paper which provided It was a simple tin of empty paper. Crucial evidence. After sprucing up his man cave in bright colors, a Reubman had left the discarded tins of paint just hanging around in another corner of the abandoned circuit city. Oh, he was slovenly? He was sloppy. See, if you're going to live in a place like that, every piece of clothing, every piece of backpack, every piece of fucking food, every storage receptacle, everywhere you touch, anything that you leave is evidence against you in a court case, right? If you're living in a public place like that, I've done it before. I lived in a public apart apartment complex in a one bedroom size, or I'm sorry, one closet size little thing the size of a of a bedroll the 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 room was the size of a bedroll that's exactly what would fit in there and that's what i fit in there it was the size of a bedroll and i had to i had to cramp up because the room wasn't big enough for a six foot four man and i lived in there for an entire year just like this dude lived in the toys r us right and one of the things that you learn very quickly is anything out of sort is essentially in your face it's like in your lap or on your chest or in your pockets or something if anything is out of the place at all like you can't really live in in something that's the size of a of a bedroll and, and still i mean he he had a bigger space than that but i didn't so like so like yeah I, I like a little tin with empty paper i never ever ever would have not thrown that away particularly because it leaves evidence that you were there Every time I left in the morning, I was fucking convinced that somebody came to my house, checked my possessions, checked my belongings, looked for valuables, stole my drugs or anything like that. I was convinced of this. And I, I was like, every time I leave my burnt out restaurant, I know that someone else will come in here directly to where I live and try to take this place from me. You know, I know that they will. And they did. They did try. The cops, there was other homeless people. I mean, they tried fingerprint found on one of the tins finally they just knocked down the restaurant rather than evicting me they just knocked down the restaurant because they couldn't evict me it wasn't even like a a house it was a burnt out restaurant that they neglected for six years so nobody could say anything that if the, if the owner had cried to the to, to the g that there was somebody living in their burnt out restaurant the g would have been like you haven't replace the burnt out restaurant in six years on the most uh successful block in denver you know it was the most successful business block in denver's south pearl and uh uh louisiana or i'm sorry yeah south pearl and louisiana essentially over to pennsylvania pennsylvania it's like the most successful most richie 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 mcrichardson uh money block in denver short of ray street and like that that whole vibe is is not disorder if you leave anything out of place it, it immediately susses you out to not only the cops but probably the owner who immediately comes and, and evicts you because they're scared that you're gonna fucking choke to death on their on their property or something and, and, and delete the value like 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 he probably did to the toys r us him hiding in the back of that circuit city and that toys r us was probably so bad for that co for that company and that business and that particular uh, location it was probably so bad for them match that of jeffrey manchester Not you've got creepers hiding in the walls in your toy company you understand how scary that is to the public you've got creepers hide with guns who hide in the wall and rob mcdonald's and banks and and, and hide in your toy display in the back in the in the in, in the circuit city in the converted break room that they don't use anymore because nobody's been there in six years they only care about what what you know circuit what money can circuit city can make today not what not what the dead circuit city building can do in 2022 so you know and that's weird because it's weird because when you think of it Circuit City could make a lot of money if you were just an, allowed to enable it to do it. If you were to fill Circuit City with tons of TVs and tablets and stuff like Best Buy, I imagine you would probably do a lot of business like fucking Best Buy. But no, they, they did these old flash screens from the 80s and 90s for way too long and they died out and they didn't follow the tech at all. And they were not competitive on the, in, the modern, in the modern era like Best Buy was, so they lost to Best Buy. Now I don't care what some dude does in the back of a Circuit fucking 
city. I really don't care what he does, as long as it's not like raping children or murdering people. I don't care that he's back there. Frankly, that's one less mouth on the government dole, you know? If he's taking care of himself, it's one less mouth on the government dole. Like me, I, my mouth is on the government dole. I don't want it to be like that, but, I mean, I have opposition authority, authority for all the times that the government and all the druggies tried to kill me, you know? I've got weird mental problems and fucking PTSD and I don't deal well with humans and I don't and in the minute that they anger me I just immediately step like I'm Neo and I'm running the motherfucking place. Even my mother, if, if, if they cross me, if any human crosses me, I immediately take control and I run that bitch like Neo. You understand? Not, not like Neo, like Morpheus. I run that bitch like Morpheus. I just tell them what to do. I tell them how to get it out of their problem. I tell them why I don't like them anymore and why they're crossing me. And I'll go and fix it. And I don't care about bygones, 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 bygones or like, 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 not, like holding a grudge or anything like that. I just dislike that you crossed me ever. Don't ever cross me ever. You know? How will that to do? It was fine to him. By early January 2005, the city of Charlotte was heaving with posters and flyers asking for information on the whereabouts of Jeffrey Manchester and warning citizens that a dangerous... We've got a creeper hiding in the Toys R Us walls. And that thing that you've always been the most terrified of, yeah, it's a reality. Yeah, there's a there's a creeper stalker in the back fucking walls of the Toys R Us, and he's living in the fucking in the ball display for those bouncy balls that the five year olds play with. And if any of the five year olds ever go missing, I wonder why. Oh, maybe loose in the local area. And of course, these photographs. Like like we were very lucky that this guy was not a pederast because he easily could have been just abducting children straight out of the fucking aisle. And they would have been like, where? Jeffrey Manchester. Oh, uh, eventually glimpsed. I think that's maybe why he's in the Toys R Us. You ever actually wondered about that? I, you could not pay me to try to rob Toys R Us. I don't care what toys are worth. Only weird Dwight Schrute weirdos would gravitate to a Toys R Us if they're an adult. I really feel this way a lot of the time. Same thing with My Little Pony or, or all the fucking anime or anything like that. If you're gravitating to Disney adult stuff, you probably don't have that good of a grip on your life. It's okay that you do these things but it's also like i believe those are crutches that you are using to get through your daily life and i wonder sometimes like maybe if this guy was in a toys r us for a fucking reason he was thinking the ultimate fucking disgusting chomo thought which is what if i could just abduct them in the toy aisles themselves you know and they and the mothers wouldn't even be able to find them because they don't care about their kids so much so that, that they just let them run wild and rampant and free in the toy store. And so then, you know, the dude in the fucking hiding in the fucking toy display goes goes out of the bushes like Homer and, and, and abducts some kid and you never hear about it ever. You never hear about it because the parent doesn't want to admit that the child ran away at Toys R Us. They don't want to admit that they lost them. They don't want to admit that they weren't that bad that, that they were that bad of a parent that they lost their child. They don't want to admit this stuff. They don't. And you can see how somebody like this might really use that to actually fucking fund or fuel some kind of terrible pederast nightmare. And I see that in his eyes. I see a weird sickness in his eyes. It's this desire to hold secrets. I don't have it. Like, look me in the eyes. You see what I'm saying? I, I, I don't have secrecy in my eyes. Do you see it? I don't have it. I, don't, I just don't have, like, this the bedroom eyes where you're kind of, like, hiding something or whatever. You Like, the secrecy. It's just not there. I don't have it. I'm not hiding anything from you like this guy. You know? Of the this guy's creeping around in the back of the toy store behind the toy display. And, and sleeping in a break room in a broken down business like I was sleeping in the fucking burnt out restaurant. But the difference is he's not some poor drug, drug, drug addict on the streets. He's there because he wants to be there. And I see that in his eyes. He wants to be there. He wants to be near the children. He wants to be near the toys. He's regressed himself. I see something of a child molester here, unfortunately. And I think it's weird because a lot of people, I think they want to kind of paint this guy like the barefoot bandit and say that barefoot bandit and say that he's really cool, like the barefoot bandit. But no, I think the barefoot bandit was cool. I think this guy had a weird pederast approach to everything that he did from even hiding in the toy display at the toy store. 
When I think of hiding at the toy display at the toy store, I think of Pederas. I'm sorry, I don't think of like, oh, it's the manager of the store and he's playing a, a kind trick upon the wonderful, uh, you know, store dwelling uh, buyers that have come to his business. No, 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 no. People who think up uh, how to find a secret place to hide in a toy store are probably looking to abduct children in broad daylight. And that's the that's the inference. I'm sorry. That's the that's the takeaway that I'm going to give here. I see it in the eyes. I see it in in the, the authority defiance. It's weird because uh, you couldn't ever catch me cre creeping around a toy store after hours because that's so pedo and creeper and child and you know centric that I just would never want to paint myself as something like that. I would never be willing to admit that I stayed the night in a toy store because it sounds creeper like something a pedo file would do and i think it's weird because i think these weird republican like you know kind of stuck up people that that view this as some kind of smug like you know topic or or, or like you know a water cooler topic or something like that as opposed to the true horrific acts that, that that he actually got up to i think they want to excuse this sort of behavior by just saying oh he was so clever and he was so idiosyncratic you know, he was so idiosyncratic and and had all these crazy fo foibles and he wasn't kidding and all this stuff yeah he's going at it with the with, with honestly the sort of dedication that a groomer goes at it with you ever wonder what his motivations are I know that my motivations aren't like that, but I think this guy's are. I see it in the eyes. I think he's hiding something. I think he's got a smirk. I think he knows something that we don't know. I think there's a reason he's hiding in toy stores. And I'm sorry, but you, you, you see a hero here, kind of like, catch me if you can. But I see a pederast. Rhodes Presbyterian Church, you suddenly realized that Mob and John. But I don't know any pederasts, so I don't know. I don't know if I'm good at detecting it or what. I don't know any pederasts. I've never known any. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I'm good at that. I, mean, I don't know if I'm spot on or what. But I think creeping around the toy store for weeks on end and hiding behind the toy display so that the cops can't find you because you were robbing McDonald's places where the kids are. And what's the unifying fucking factor here? It's kids, isn't it? Circuit City, Toys R Us. I mean, this is how a profiler would look at it. Maybe not so much Circuit City, but definitely Circuit City sells toys, though. Toys, like, you know, technological toys and stuff. And, and, and I, I think I see a pederast using hiding in the store as a thief as cover for pederasty. And I wonder, they never probably looked. I wonder if they really searched that store because I bet there's bodies. I see a killer here, and I will just tell you what I think. I think I see a killer pederast here, like uh, like uh, John Wayne John Wayne Gacy, and the only reason that John Wayne Gacy was ever discovered was the smell, I think, and I think they weren't even trying to smell for the bodies, and I guarantee that, that pro probably that Circus City and that Toys R Us are probably still standing. And I bet if they were to actually run some radar around those com around those fucking businesses, they're going to find out the real truth about this guy and why he was hiding in the toy store. Zorn might not be all he seems. Naturally, it was John Zorn's partner. It's weird because weird stuck up people are probably like, oh, the genius of hiding in a toy store is selling toys that you stole from the kids. But I'm like, is that really genius or is it actually morally bankrupt, terrifying, you know, the, the, the level of private privacy violation is up there with that that guy who used to film all the motel rooms with that, you know, that he owned at his motel. Like the, it, it's up there with people that like to put fucking cell phone cameras on on women's toilets, you know. It's disgusting. It's like literally anybody willing to steal steal their way into a toy store and hide there like some kind of predator or fucking pederast hiding in the toy display using camouflage of toys to, to, to hide from the reality. And I'm sorry, but I think you have a lot of faith in this dude because you believe him to be intelligent. I don't believe him to be intelligent. I believe him to be a pederast who does not want to get caught who used every trick that he could come up with in the book to not get caught. And I think if I were to, to, to like go and download this 
uh, uh, an English, you know, verbatim uh, version of this script. I think what I'm talking about would leak through a little bit more. One of the problems is, is it took me four hours to watch this. But I mean, like, you know, but but it's actually a fairly short piece of work. It's only like 47 minutes long or something like that. But I kept pausing it, which and we get lost in the sauce. But I think his true intent gets lost here. Only weird fucking shitty creepers are willing to sneak into a fucking national conglomerate nationwide fucking toy chain store and, and hide behind the balloons as some kind of fucking hidden entity that comes out at night. Do you understand that the, the boogeyman pederast probably moved in to the most gullible, terrible, most uh, most most uh, uh, exploitable place on the planet, which is essentially a toy store aisle? And he used all kinds of lies and crime and obfuscation and automatic weapons to, to kind of steer your attention away from what he actually was. But I posit to you that only a creeper would ever want to creep into a toy story, uh, sorry, a, toy, a Toys R Us after hours and take up residence there in a toy aisle. That is like, that is like when hunters build a duck blind. It's kind of like that, that show, uh, you know, Duck Dynasty. They're, they're really famous for making duck calls and duck blinds and stuff like that. And we've always really loved them for that because that means they're providing an actual fucking uh, service to the world that is worthy of money and, sh and should make it so that, that they deserve our, our interest and our money and our viewership and stuff. I've always really liked Duck Dynasty because they back it up with real life goods, you know. Same with uh, uh, Oompa Loompaville. He backs up his stream with real candy and real money. And I kind of respect that because it's like, if you couldn't sell anything to the kids, why would you be able to sell anything to adults, right? And I need you to be functioning in the real world and making money as a businessman if you're going to be a businessman in America. But, but, but your first concept is to rob McDonald's by drilling holes in the ceilings, kidnapping McDonald's workers at will and using them as like essentially like pieces on a game board stealing their $2,000 accruing about 120,000 and using it to immediately move into a toy store the toy store so you can secretly watch the toy store patrons and and live inside of the toy store where all the children come to every day and, and if I can think of, of guaranteed places where children go, it would be the recess at school, bedtime, all kids go to bedtime and all kids go to recess at school, right? And the toy store, all of the kids go to the toy store sooner or later. I think he knows that he can't hang out at the goddamn recess. And I think he knows that he can't hide out at the goddamn, you know, whatever else kids like or whatever. So he ha he hangs out and, and lives in the toy store. And you wonder why the motive sounds so creepy and weird? It's because there's a reason that he's doing that. He was probably abducting children in the toy store, raping them and leaving them in the fucking rafters of the toy store. This is somebody who was hurt by his family very sick, willing to stick a gun, an automatic weapon in people who run candy stores and stuff like that. People who people who run stores faces and stuff like this. This is a really, really sick dude. No matter what, how smart he might come across, like Catch Me If You Can, is still a really, 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 really sick liar like the Catch Me If You Can guy. The Wayne Scotty. I received the biggest shock of all. Like, uh, like, 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 uh, like, like, uh, like, uh, like he mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Subway guy, uh, you know, the Subway guy, what's his name? Jared. Jared's like that too. One of the reasons that Jared was at Subway is because he knew that it was universally loved by kids. And people want to say that he picked up his, his weird pederasty through his porn addiction and traveling overseas and his weird child sex, like, like chomo partner. But no, I think he actually came by it naturally and he, and he just chases kids. I think it's actually really creepy. And I think Subway was his first like weird innate desire to chase kids, you know, because he knew that kids would see him. Kids all over the world would see him. It's disgusting, you know. After the police were able to confirm. Like one of the things that I do when I when I do this streamer career is I lead into the I, I lean into the recording side of it, and I tell you all the time that I'm doing this as a as a as a as a as a, 
uh, you know, as a history and I'm trying to release a history that people watch and, and they can come back to here in 10 years and they can see what I was doing on, a, on August 17th in 2024, right? And I, I keep telling people all the time that it's a history, right? And, and, and the reason that I do this is because I think most of the other people that do this, I think they do it so they can appeal to children and get clout with children. I think Mr. Beast does that. I think they all do it. And it's weird because I couldn't give a flying fuck what some kid thinks about my fucking career. I don't care about kids. Like, I would like my own kids, but I don't care about other kids, and I don't value what they think, and I don't want to be a fucking around them. I don't care about their opinion of my work. I don't think they've been around long enough on the fucking planet to understand the subtleties or what it is that I'm delivering to you. I just don't like kids, you know? I wouldn't really ever want them in my career. Yet, I become a video game streamer, right? And you can say the same thing about this guy, but the difference is he's living in the toy store as a predator killer guy who robs McDonald's at gunpoint and, and, and toy stores and stuff and, and he's and he's living in the fucking toy store aisle in the fake display and and, and using the the break room in the in the in the in the uh, circus city next door to get away with his many many felonies right my desire my, sorry my reality is not like that my reality has not been like that I, I could never have a reality like that i could never appeal to people like that i would never try to trick kids like that i would never be in the same place as them past the age of like 24 or something like that unless they're like you know family or friends family or something like that i just wouldn't really be around them but yet these people are constantly like oh he built a fucking a nickelodeon empire he was living in the toy store I'm sorry, he was living in the toy display at the Toys R Us while he was robbing McDonald's, you know? And it's weird because that stuff, it, like, I'm sorry, but I see ulterior, uh, I see ulterior sicko motives there for some reason. I really do. I see ulterior sicko, sicko motives. And I don't think the story's over yet either. John Zorn and Jeffrey Manchester were one and the same. They paid Lee. The partner, Lee Wainscott. Lee a visit news. Shock Lee initially refused to believe it until she finally saw evidence with her own. Yeah, she learned that the dude that she thought was her husband, who only shows up like four times a year because of his a job with the government, right, actually is a weird, like, Toys R Us dwelling pederast dude who, like, you know, kills people and holds people at gunpoint and ro armed robs McDonald's while kids are there. And she's like, no, no, I don't want to believe that this dude I never see is actually Satan. But yeah, this dude you never see is actually Satan. I'm terribly sorry. Nice. After the police showed her Jeffrey Manchester's profile on America's Most Wanted, and she found herself looking at the same guy that she'd been dating for months. Yep. Lee yeah, you can't West fucking West argue West with America's West Most West Wanted. It's why I won't fuck with America's Most Wanted. I can do the kind of crimes that would take me to America's Most Wanted. I started to. I tried to re. I tried to connect. A drug dealer prostitution ring between the Northwest and the fucking Midwest in a very verifiable way where all of the hookers would be dealing dope and all of the drug dealers would be dealing hookers. Am I proud of this? No. And it was a woman who convinced me to try and do this, too. It's a woman who convinced me to try and do this. Name, name Carmen. But... We could all sense and smell the heroin money, how much heroin money, you know, we could get from doing that. So we attempted to build a cross-country prostitution drug ring. You know, like ones want to do occasionally. And uh, yeah, we found out very quickly that none of us wanted to kill anybody with heroin. None of us wanted to sell our bodies. No, none of us wanted to sell women. And none of us wanted to be in a drug ring. And, uh, yeah. And that's how that ended. We just let it go. But was I fucking good friends with them for, like, five years? Yeah, one of them's dead. My friend Alan is dead. And his brother's still alive. My friend Carmen is, is maybe alive, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, and I don't know if they're alive or dead. But if I wanted to, I could just take over the town I live in by making a single phone call. You ever had that kind of power? If I wanted to, if I cared about living in this place, if I cared about living where I live, I don't. I don't care about the people here. I was not raised here. I don't care about if it lives or dies. I consider this place short bustling, and often the short bustling side of it actually pains me. And I, I love this place, and I'll live here for the rest of my life. 
But I am a Denver baby, and I've always been a fucking Denver baby, and I'm on the ro road like Jack Kerouac down at fucking, you know, Lar uh, like the Tamarack Square or Larimer Square. And I, I don't, you know, I, I and I'm, I'm, I'm old school fucking transcendentalist poet, lead singer, druggie. And, and, and there's nothing that you can offer me. There's not, there's nothing that I want. I can, I can deliver my own soliloquy. I can make my own drugs. I can give myself an orgasm. I can vote my own president in. I can make my own political party. I have a utopia. I'm living it right now. You're watching it right now. It's these three games right here. It's utopia. Nothing bad ever happens unless I take risks. And, 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 and honestly, if I don't want to take risks, I don't have to. I live in this utopia that's beautiful with all these computer-generated graphics and all this stuff. And I think about it all the time about how I don't want to tell anybody else what to do like you. And that's why I hate you. I don't want to tell anybody else what to do all the time. You believe in structure and order. I believe in chaos, and I think your fucking piece of shit plans are basically just the deprivation and starvation of, of your loved ones. I don't think you can plan for success or failure in this society. I don't think you can say whether a business is going to make it or not. I, I just know that you have to try, and I think the minute that, that, that we don't try, it's gone. You know, it's gone. He was very well spoken, well dressed, clean. Generous. Yep, I, I would say the same about myself if I had any money. I'm well spoken. I would be well dressed if I could afford maybe more than five dollars for a pair of socks at Walmart. I am clean. I've been clean all of my life, and I, I'll give you the shirt off my back. I don't care who you are. Hey, guys, do you need the shirt off my back? Are you cold? Are you homeless and alone somewhere? I will mail you my fucking shirt because I do not fucking care about possessions. I will mail you my fucking shirt. I'm literally that guy who gives you his shirt off, the, off his back. My pastor in my congregation. Now, can I stand you? No. Do I, should I, do I believe that you should profit off me? No, I'm poorer than you. And, and, and anybody who needs to hunt me is the worst hunter in history. Anybody who, who needs to get money off me or take advantage of me is, is the poorest person in history because I am the poorest person in history. I've had the least amount of money, I think, in my entire lifetime. There's people in goddamn third world countries who did better than me, you know? And so I'm, I'm just saying that... While I can't ignore that that's a fact and I don't want to have a bias from it and I don't want to hate anybody over it or be some kind of Johnny come fucking lately about like my, my, my pessimism or anything like that. No, I, I really believe that these things are necessary and that people need to change. And I believe in, in listening to people when they talk and being there with them when they do an intro or something like that. But I also believe that that I don't think they know any better than I do. I don't think the government knows any better than I do. I don't think the streamers do. I don't think uh, I don't think this guy knows better than me. I don't think the roof man knows better than me. I think I know better than most people. I think you could you could spend some money trying to record the information and use it again and try to use what I just said. But honestly, I don't even remember what I just said. I know that I can use this information to entertain you, and that's all I know. Immediately, on top of that. So my pastor and my congregation all fell in love with him immediately, right? Poor news for you. Yeah, it happens all the time when you're a real person who talks real talk. I can't uh, teachers fall in love with me. The class the class fucking the class pet the teacher's pets all fall in love with me because they know that I can contend with the teacher on their own goddamn ground. And I'll talk about fallacies with the teacher, you know? And so nerds tend to love me, but I actually really can't stand fucking nerds. I actually really can't stand them. Most of them are swarmy and shitty and superior and stuck up and imbalanced and fucked up and never did any drugs, never took a swing, never took the leap of faith, often are incel, often are this and that. And so nerds kind of bother me, not because that they're smart, but because oftentimes I talk to somebody who my community thinks is a super nerd and I'm like, you are boring. You are boring. I would take a game of of goddamn Minesweeper over this. You are boring. You are citing the same fucking premise that they've cited out of textbooks for 55 years, but I actually kind of need you to talk about uh, the slippery slope fallacy, you know? I need you to talk about slippery slope fallacy as opposed to just nodding your head when I speak about it, you know? Do you guys know what the slippery slope fallacy is? It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Slippery slope fallacy is when 
A logical fallacy that claims a single action or event will lead to a more extreme event or action. And so, like, we believe that maybe if we let Mr. Beast get away with his child molestation friends, he'll probably just fall down to child molestation, something more extreme event or action. I'm watching Tom Dark and people like that who, who do this for a living and make a good, good amount of money doing it stumble and fall trying to describe what Slippery Slope actually is. But it's this understanding that if you think that something isn't a trustable source... You, you aren't ever going to think that they're a trustable source, right? And we have a very, very slippery slope fallacy when it comes to... That turned out to be quite fortuitous for the police, even if it pissed all over Lee's birthday candles. After Crime, money, power, clout, desire, MO, modus operandi, uh, reasons incentives whatever right we think that it's all reasons and everything but but no we're actually this really basic reptile being beast that wants to give you a yes or no answer inside of a second finally coming to terms with the fact that she'd fallen in love with a man who didn't exist they yep. agreed to spend her 40th birthday. i watched uh watched something else about this today uh uh wavy web smurf did a really good video about um disturbing squatter cases from around the internet where people believe that they literally are, are are able to stay in a home that they aren't paying for because they've been there so long that 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 that, that they are incapable of believing that their presence there isn't um you know malign but but their presence there is malign they aren't paying for it they didn't make the house they didn't you know summon up the money or the producers to make it possible for the sale they didn't do the sale they didn't fix up the house or anything like that but you surprise you'd be surprised how many americans believe that they have a right to property through eminent domain which is when you live somewhere as a squatter for so long that you just become the owner because no owner has showed up for 30 or 40 years right and honestly, I, th I think that most American policy is based off slippery slope like this, where it's it, like we don't we don't we, we think of homelessness as bad because we know how slippery of a slope it is. Maybe you start getting drunk. Maybe you start doing drugs. Maybe you don't pay for rent and you end up on a sidewalk. That's a slippery slope to us. It's a slippery slope policy where we write you off as a worthless human being who put getting high over the value of staying in the culture and fighting the battle. Right. But honestly, all that is is a person with a drug addiction. That's all it is. It's not them fa failing you. It's not them eating your food or, 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 or using your resources any more than they should. They are your fellow Americans, and they must succeed if you wish to succeed. But we are not like this. We think that because somebody like, like Mr. Beast showed a slippery slope, we don't ever trust him again. Because, uh, you know, Car Camden Gerard davis uh ripped off ralph and and what's her name and, and and all those people from the the podcast we don't ever trust him again but i mean slippery slopes are called a slippery slope for a reason the person using the fallacy assumes a cause and effect relationship between the events without evidence right we assume that because mr beast is getting canceled he must have done something wrong but no, I don't see something who's done, who's done something wrong here. I've seen somebody who just doesn't say no. I think there's a big difference between somebody who never says no to the creatives in his life who, who, who propose what his, his value is and what his, his product is. I don't see that as the same thing as being a child molestation, pederast, bad actor. I don't see it as the same thing. What your friends do does not equal what you do. It, it is a fallacy. It's, it's called one true Scotsman, right? One true Scotsman. I think one of the most, oh, sorry, one of the best things that I can do for my community is to show the, the, the list of fallacies and memorize them because most of the people engaging in Twitter arguments today on the internet are pretty much straw man chaffing all the time. They're just, they're just like, all the time, they're either mountains out of molehills, all the fallacies, I'll list them, right? One true Scotsman, slippery slopes, like I can't even remember all of it, right? Equivocation, to quote, 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 
uh, division fallacy, affirmation, the, the, this idea that, that because everybody else is being positive, you should too, and all this weird stuff, you know? And, 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 and yeah, 31 logical fallacies in eight minutes. Let's go. Fallacy of composition. If it's true of the parts, then it's true of the whole. If there are three... This is, right, so three. everybody is currently engaging in, in fallacies of composition where they believe that because everybody on social media is saying this and it's true of the parts, then it's true of the whole. But no, I just actually had a conversation with my mother today about how she, about how she really didn't know who Mr. Beast was at all. And the composition of the world's arguments in, 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 the, in the pop culture stage right now is about Mr. Beast's, Mr. Beast's cancellation and Trump's cancellation and Biden's cancellation and, and, and Harris's uh, anointment. And I think that uh, it's, you know, and, and I think that, that, that these things are our fallacy of composition because we believe that that is true of the parts, then it's true of the whole and that all of us should be fighting child molestation. All of us should be fighting Trump or Biden. All of us should be, you know, it, and it's actually a faulty assumption to believe that it, because everybody else is it, everybody else in the composition is bitching about something that you should, too. No, no, no. Players on my hockey team, then my hockey team must also be great, right? And the opposite fallacy of division. If it's true. Oh, sorry, she said it better, right? So you think that there's three great players on your hockey team, but so then your hockey team must be great? But no, no. Hockey teams can absolutely suck even when they have Patrick Raw. I know, because I had him in on the Avalanche for many years be true of the parts. If my flat is about half the size of your flat, then it follows logically that my doors must be half the size of your doors. No, no. Gambler's fallacy is the idea that streaks of good luck or bad luck exist and are not just... I live off the gambler's fallacy. I believe right now that if I, if I were to gamble on EVE Online, I will win. And I believe I have been successful in this assumption when you see that out of the 2,400 that I've joined, I've won 1,200, which means that exactly 50% of the time I win. If I'm betting 4 million on a 333 million, but I win half the time, I'm going to make a lot of money. Do you see it? I'm going to make a lot of money. And, 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 and so I make this gambler's fallacy that because I win half of the time, which I do, I win half the time. If I win half of the time on these cheap bets that only cost, you know, seven million, right? Count it up, right? There's 12 right here. If I win half the time, right? If I win half the time, this is the gambler's fallacy. It's a really bad one. If I win exactly one half of the time, I believe that is exactly one half of the time, 2358, 1188, right? I see that there's a 50% chance to win across all the games that I play. And I go back to the hypernet and I look at the numbers and I, I realize that there's a number here. There's four on the top, four on the middle, and four on the 12, right? And I go back and I remember that, uh, you know, yeah, uh, it turns out that I'm winning 50% of the time. So if I look at this, these 12 bids, I think I'm going to win half of these, right? So now half of these added up is like 59 plus 47 is 100. That's that's two ships of the six. 255 plus, you know, 255 is 355. Here's one for 23.8. We hit 388. Another 20 makes 400. And another 1.23 billion makes, you know, whatever. Let's skip that one and call it a Blackbird and say that it's 10 million isk. And so I get about 420 million after six bets, right? I skip the Nightmare and I skip the Endurance. Or I'll, I'll skip the emulator because it doesn't have value, right? I'm going to buy all of these right now to, 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 to show you that I'm, I'm willing to gamble behind the fucking system that I built, right? But I know that I'm winning 50% of the time because I'm not stupid. So I come betting on all of them knowing that I'll win 50% of them. Now, I'm only spending 9, 10... I'm sorry, tw I'm sorry 20, 27, 34... 41, 44, 48, 50, 52, 51, 51 million isk, right? It only cost me 51 million isk to bet across the board on all of these. 
I'm going to win half of them because I'm winning half the time. I mean, I really am. I'm literally, I, I bet 2,400 hands and I won literally half of them. You see it? So I, I expect to lose half of this. I expect to win half of this. I want to win half of this, but even if I win two of these 12, I will be so far ahead of what I bet... And so, and this is the gambler's fallacy. Nope, I will lose. I will lose all my money if I do this. The gambler's fallacy is correct, right? The idea that streaks of good luck or bad luck exist, right? No, I'm, I, I'm saying that I'm telling myself in my mind that because I've won exactly 50% of all of my bets, that I will be winning 50% of all of my bets in a row. But no, I might win. I might lose all twelve of all all twelve of these bets. I might and probably will lose all twelve of these bets, even though statistically I shouldn't. And so all the time, my life is this constant argument between the success that I've already had and and the gambler's fallacy that defeats me, where I believe that there's some streak that actually isn't there. You know. So now we come back and we look at these single bets that I'm doing and we do some synchronization. If I win one of these bets, I walk with 300 million even though I only spent 60. That's one of these bets I'm supposed to win 6 of the 12. And you begin to understand how I came to the fastest game in, in, in the universe. I gravitated to it. I mastered it. I dominated it. I took it. And I, I might not win all the time, right? But I know the game. I know the game inside and out. I know I know it very quickly. I know I know how to win. I know what my percentages are. I know what I can and can't do. And so then I bet one on all 12 of these. I hope I win six. If I win six, that might be 20, 30, 37, 40, 44. Yep, 44 million. If I'm lucky, but it might be a lot. If I win the big ones, it might be a lot, right? It might be really a lot. Like some of these are a lot, like 23, 19, 1.23 billion. If I win this one, it's a lot. So in my weird gambler's fallacy brain, I believe that because I'm betting on all of them, I have a fairly good gambler's fallacy chance that because I'm winning 50% of the time, I have a 50% chance of winning this nightmare at 1.23 billion on a 3 million buyout. You understand how many times I'm going to I'm going to 100,000 times my profit if I win this nightmare and I took the swing that I couldn't possibly get on a 512 swing and I didn't get it and I'm not going to get it. But if I do win the nightmare, this not only pays for this page, it pays for this page. It pays for this page. If I win one of these items, it pays for this page, this page, this page, the next page, sorry. Gotta go back. And so, and, and the gambler fallacy in me goes nuts and I'm like, oh my God, if I play roulette and I cover all the bets, I don't believe bad luck exists in this game because I am literally winning 50% of the time. I don't believe bad bad luck wins. I don't believe bad luck exists in, in roulette. And I don't believe bad luck exists in, in, in hypernet either because I have a 50% win rate. And I've got 21 active, and on top of it, if you if you add that I'm making sales, I have made so much liquid income off gambling. Do I believe I can do this all the time? Absolutely not. The gambler's fallacy is the idea that streaks of good luck or bad luck exist and are not just random. But no, they don't. They don't exist. They're not there. The rainy days for a week or the uh, I'm on fire, that doesn't exist. It never did. You tricked yourself when you were a kid, when you were playing NBA Jam, to believe that you could be on fire all the time, but nope. Random noise. It's been red six It's just random noise. Honestly, this right here, this, 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 this 1188 one, 2330, 2376 joined, that is random noise. It is not the 50% that it looks like. It really means nothing. But because I have the gambler's fallacy thing going so strong, I tell themselves that I can win 50% of every single page. And I do. I do, or I wouldn't have this number. I tell myself that I can win. 
It's literally like the secret. I just put it out. I put it out to the universe that I could win this anathema for four million. You know, I just put it out there. I believe that it can happen. I believe that I can get this Osprey for two million. I believe that I can get this Stormbringer. That's worth five hundred two million isk for a one million buyout. I just believe that if I play all twelve games and I have a fucking gambler's fallacy to statistics of fifty percent win, which is something that Doyle fucking Brunsvold would lick my balls for. I'm, I'm dead serious. I win 50% of the bets that I make, and I carefully, I carefully consider every single one that I do. You know, unless I, I like to spam. I'm spamming one and one bets on all these these good bets and stuff. But honestly, the gambler's fallacy has informed me that I am at a 50% win rate. So if I take that 50% win rate and I apply it to this page, I am a mega god rich. I'm mega god rich. I'm Bill Gates rich. You know. But no, actually, there's no such thing as 50% win rate. There's no such thing as the history. There's no such thing as completed in one or joined in one or anything like that. There's no such thing as I'm on fire or I caught the bullets or anything like that. There's no dog balls or, or, or seven deuce on the, on the fucking river or anything like that. There's nothing like that. That's all in your fucking mind. All of it, including loss. So if I tell myself that, 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 that like I can't win this, I won't. But right now I'm telling myself very much so that tomorrow I'm going to come back and I'm going to deal with 18 gambles, which broke my bank down to 50% of what it was. But I still did, you know, 24 gambles that I believe I'm going to win 12 of. If any of those 12 that I win are one of these ones that are worth 150 or, or, or you know, whatever, 130, right? I have, I have absolutely not only tripled my money, but, but I'm going to win a lot more than just that one. And watch me literally gambler's fallacy myself out of all of my money because that is a false assumption. I can go all 24 of these without winning. Happens all the time. Happens to me every day. I can go through all 24 of these and, and, and on a 1 to 8 bet and I still will lose all 24 of them. I, I have rolled 27 snake eyes in a, in a row in my lifetime with 7 witnesses or 9 witnesses I think it was. And like I have actually done that. You know I've rolled snake eyes 27 times in a row. The mathematician will tell you it's not possible. The people that don't believe in magic will tell you that, it, that it's not possible. But the magic people who understand that you can do anything that you put your fucking mind to, including destroy the universe, you know? You can literally, like, do anything that you put your human mind to. It's something really beautiful about life. I believe that, that, that a fennec fox can destroy the universe. Will that happen? No. The chances of it happening are so low that, that no, a fennec fox will never dream up the death of a universe and cause it to happen. But I believe it to be possible. Yes, I am crazy. Yes, I believe in magic. Yes, I believe in the force. Yes, I believe in God when I'm in love. Yes, I believe in stupid things that don't exist or whatever the fuck. But it doesn't really matter. I still believe that love and God and the force will definitely make sure that I pull my 50% win rate when I want my fucking 50% win rate and I've dreamed it up for myself in my own weird world that I built for myself. And in my own weird hypernet world, I dreamed up a 50% win rate because I was like, oh my God, if I win 50% of the time, Time, it'll print endless money and I don't know what I'm on but it's something like 10 or 20 billion now or something like that I'm up at I'm up at like four thousand dollars US or something like that off this belief that that I can win 50% of the time now this is a gambler's fallacy I can't win 50% of these bets you don't believe me I can run them I can't run 50% of the I cannot win 50% of these bets I cannot I'm betting in on one on 512 one on eight, one out of 48, one out of, you know, I can't win 50% of these bets. But because I believe in the gambler's fallacy and I believe in God and I believe in the force and I believe in the energy and all of that other crazy ass shit that just doesn't fucking exist, I fall to the gambler's, ga the gambler's fallacy and I believe that life isn't a sucker's game and it isn't a blood sport, but it is. Life is a blood sport. Life is just a blood sport. It's 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 to see how much resources you can gather while like while you're here on your stay. Times in a row, it's on a streak. Too quickly, or who are you, who are to, you talk? to talk? Right? Just because uh, I do drugs doesn't mean that I don't know about drug policy. 
Okay. If your sister, who does no exercise, says, you should do 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise a week to be healthy, it is the too quoque fallacy to say, I'll do it when you do. Who are you to lecture me about what exercise I should be doing? And just because you are like something doesn't mean that I'm something, right? It's that same old slippery slope. It's, it's the straw man. Not doing exercise. You are making an assumption about somebody else, but no, I, actually, they're the ones making the assumption. They're assuming that you're going to come up with the same exact answer. Says nothing about whether or not you should do it. Yeah, yeah, like like they assume that you should just come up. Like one of the re really big problems of today is most humans believe that you should fall to the same trap that they fell to. And this isn't some weird Sigma talk, like fucking stupid ass fucking weird toxic fucking masculinity cocksucker fucking Andrew Tate or, or any of those, you know, all the little fucking soy boy fucking uh, piece of shit fucking conservative fucking reptard fucking worthless Americans, right? I'm talking it from a true sense of like, if you straw man yourself, you will ruin other people. Oh man, willfully misrepresenting an argument. If you if you willfully represent mis if you willfully misrepresent something, you will not be the one who pays the cost. It'll be someone else in your community, which is the slippery slope fallacy. And often in a or to quote way, which is like you know, oh, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. They, if I suffer, then you have to suffer. No, no, not everybody has to suffer. No hyperbolic fashion. We should cut down on our use of fossil fuels. Oh, so no. You so you want to burn and ban all cars and make 80-year-olds with suitcases run around on bicycles, do you? Cars and make 80-year-olds... Look at the eyes, right? It's straw man. It's like, oh my god, that argument that you have scares the living shit out of me, so I'm gonna blow it up into this thing that sounds like a fucking na na a national disaster. Suitcases run around on bicycles, do you? No. Ad hominem. No. Um, you're evil, an evil witch, burn the witch and I love how she is like, no, and she answers herself because a lot of fallacies are answered with no. Don't listen to the witch's opinions. They're the Ad hominem, don't listen to the witch. She's She uses magic, so she's evil. Don't listen to, uh, you know, uh... Devil's words. Sometimes people are obviously biased or subjective, and so you should treat their arguments with care, but... It generally better form to attack the argument rather than the person. So yep. I'd be like, what you're saying is goddamn stupid, but I'll 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 defend your right to idiot you know to idi idiotically recite it you know with my life. But related to this is the genetic fallacy, which is assuming that assuming that like just because you always had that argument means that you're gonna always have that argument. No, no, you don't just inherit things. The only thing that you inherit in this life is, is like chromosomes. You don't inherit debt. That's actually something some other human did to you. It is automatically wrong. Because what was that? There was like a crazy flash outside my door. A car. Because of its source. Even a stopped clock is right twice a day. Fallacious. I love fallacious appeal. Appeal to authority. Sometimes it's appropriate to look at what experts think on a topic, but fallacious appeals to authority bring in someone who's an expert in an entirely unrelated field and expect you to treat them as an expert in this field. Being an expert in particle physics doesn't mean you'll automatically have sensible opinions. Yeah, like I've always struggled with this idea that like a doctor can actually heal people. Because doctor is this blanket phase, phrase that goes across so many different specialties in so many different ways. And they all they all act like they know how to resuscitate resuscitate you if you are dying of, of, of oxygen deprivation or something. Or you swallow something wrong. Or maybe they, they, they can like kind of give you advice about genetics or, or, or diet or stuff. But no, it turns out that everybody has sensible opinions if they aren't biased by poison or something else or somebody trying to change their opinion about something so honestly your opinion can often be as valid as the world's renowned fucking author uh, author uh, you know uh, authority on that on that subject you'd be surprised like 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 uh, uh, goodwill hunting was it was exactly about this like the idea that that somebody from the ghetto can't solve the hardest math equation ever come up with and, and that's a ridiculous, God, that's ridiculous, that is, you know. On, say, pig husbandry, or vice versa, red herring, a fallacy of distress. It's, it's straw man, it's, it's... 
action. Well, they might have stolen the puppy, Your Honor, but look how sad they look are. Look how sad they are. And lawyers do this all the time. Lawyers use this argument to really change the world, pretty much. To be in court. Red herrings may seem plausible, but are ultimately irrelevant. In our example, a person being sad because they have been made to come to court. All the time I struggle with this one. I'm like, that person wants to bring this point to me, but it's immaterial. It's my stream, my creation. I don't give a fuck what you think. You know? And it's like, and, and, and it's like, you know, it's not relevant. What you think is not relevant to my work. It'll never be and it never will be. What you think is not relevant to my work and never will be. I know that you really want me to think that it is, but no, no. What you guys think about my work will never be relevant. What I think about your work will never be relevant is not relevant to whether or not they actually stole a puppy. That yep, particular yep. red herring is also an example of appeal to emotion. Appeals to emotion attempt to distract you by making you feel bad for the other person. So why should we hire you for this job? Because if you don't hire me, then I'll be honest. Like, I feel that, that slavery, the, uh, sorry, the the, uh, the uh, amendment to abolish slavery, the, the was it the, the 31st Amendment? What's the, was it the 31st Amendment? I can't remember. Uh, 31st Amendment. Oh no, no, that's the rights of children. I'm thinking of, um, uh, what's, uh, slavery, uh, slavery amendment. You know, it's 13, I'm sorry, I thought of 30, I, th I think I said thir uh, 31, didn't I? But it's actually 13th amendment, right? So, uh... I believe that the argument, the logical argument about slavery would have been that all of the rich people own slaves and the slaves are the cornerstone of their financial system right now especially when it comes to cotton so i would have abolished slavery but i also would have been like you must show me how you're going to do your work without slaves by next year And, uh, but I think that how we got the abolishment of slavery was an appeal to emotion, which is just how savage it is. And it's my favorite appeal to emotion in all of time, in all, all, in all of time. But I mean, the abolishment of slavery is a fallacy. It was an appeal to emotion. It was this idea that that that, that somebody else was three fifths of a of a, of, a, of, a, of a human being or something like that, and that appeals to our emotions. So so such on a base level where we're like all e all equal. We all have the same. Swing. We all have the same mother and father. We all have the same, you know, fucking heredity and genetics and code and blood. We might be a little bit different, but we're all the same cut from the same cloth and all this. And this idea that that slavery needed to end was aberrant to most of the rich white culture because they knew that their financial system was entirely based on it. It would be the same thing as if you were to try and come to the American Congress today and say that you wanted to abolish gasoline.